recording so I don't forget. You have to accept that. And Jared, if you want to make sure you can share your screen, I'll let you know if we can see it. Okay, that looks good. So I've got 1259 plus something. We'll start promptly at one. Okay. And it's one o'clock for my computer. So uh, we can hear you, we can see your talk. So when you're ready, go ahead and start. All right, cool. That looks good, go ahead. Hi everyone, my name is Jared. And this semester I work with Professor Rule on a senior project called Developing Millimeter Wave Scattering Surfaces for Side Load Control and CMB Telescopes. So first I wanna dive into a bunch of background and context um, about the CMB uh, that will justify the project and eventually lead up to it. So first off, what actually is the cosmic microwave background or the CMB? Well, it's a black body signal that permeates the sky in all directions. And we can see a, a full sky map of that in the bottom right here. It's mostly isotropic, uh, but the small anisotropies that you see in the map are on the order of 10 to the minus five Kelvin. So they're pretty small. The signal itself comes from roughly 300,000 years after the Big Bang, when the universe became transparent enough for photons to travel through relatively uninhibited. And since then, the photons have been stretched out into the microwave regime, hence the cosmic microwave background. And there's a lot of physics embedded in these signals and their polarizations. So there's information about the universe's structure, the geometry, dark matter, dark energy, neutrinos, the reionization epoch, and, and so much more. But the signal <clears throat> was accidentally discovered in 1964 by two guys, Pinzius and Wilson, imaged here in front of their horn antenna, which they used to find it. And this uh, antenna gave a very low resolution map. So since then, they've been working on making new telescopes that use different techniques and probe at different frequencies and higher resolutions. So on the bottom right, we have the Planck Space Telescope. And above that is the ACT ground-based CMB telescope in Chile. So it, uh, the CMB, experiments in general, they try to increase the frequency bands at which they're probing the sky, and they also want to look at higher resolutions to try to extract more science from the signals. And they, they do this in a, using a variety of tools, mostly ground-based, uh, space-based, and uh, balloon-borne telescopes. But the newest and one of the more, uh, the bigger CMB efforts going on right now is called CMB S4. And It'll be comprised of 21 total telescopes stationed in both Antarctica and Chile. And they will be observing using a lot of different techniques, use uh, different frequency bands, and some on big spatial resolutions, some on small spatial resolutions over the course of seven years once observing starts. But there are two really big telescopes coming online. One is the Cross Dragon Telescope, imaged on the bottom right, that will be opened up in Chile. And Above that, we have the three mare anisthmic telescope or the TMA that will be installed at the South Pole. So my project looks more so in the TMA telescope. I wanna talk a little bit about the design. So more classically, a lot of CMB telescopes have this like open bucket design. And this, this bucket here is used as a shield to protect the telescope from stray noise that may come from the strongly emitting ground. But the TMA uses a very different design. Uh, it uses three mirrors. You can see the optical path on the bottom here where the photons enter, bounce off one, two, three mirrors into the detector plane. And there's more opportunities for stray photons to enter in and bounce around and, and perhaps hit the detector. And I should say that these noise photons are very difficult to predict how they're going to fluctuate over time. I mean, they, they change sometimes with like how the snow is drifting over the ground. But these stray photons that bounce around and hit the detectors may lead to high contrast side lobes. And so basically what a side lobe is, is an off-axis sensitivity. So if you have a, a pixel or a detector looking at a part of the sky and you have radiation that comes in off the main axis, it, it'll pick that up just as if it's looking in, in the forward direction. And these 
side lobes are really detrimental to the already faint cosmic microwave background signal. So our solution to this is to line the cabin walls of the TMA with a scattering surface. Uh, this will kind of spread out that photon power. It'll bounce around the photons and will overall reduce those side lobes. We want to avoid highly absorbing materials because they'll emit kind of strongly in black body radiation. We also want to avoid specularly reflecting materials because simulations have shown that these won't stop the side lobes from forming. We also want to produce a durable solution <clears throat> that can stand up to whatever Antarctica has to throw at it. So extreme temperatures, uh, wind going over the telescope that's vibrating it, and it has to last at least seven years throughout observation. And we also want just an easily manufactured and reproducible surface. So our first step in all this was to, to find and design a good scattering surface. And our first approach to this was just to find something that can scatter out the large angles. And we came up with two main candidate surfaces. One was various types of hemisphere configurations, which you can see on the top right is just a small snippet of one of these surfaces, but they had a lot of issues. They weren't always entirely entirely evenly scattering. Um, there was, they were hard to, to actually manufacture in these tight corners and crevices. And a lot of these surfaces had a lot of flat area, which acted a lot like specularly reflecting materials. And so we decided to go with our second candidate, which was white noise. There's an image of that surface here in the bottom right, um, which is the one that we actually produced and simulated. And I'll talk about this later. But we went with white noise for a number of reasons. We can really well parameterize the surface. So we designed our surface with a spatial cutoff frequency such that we had a significant number of 45 degree angles on the surface. You can see a plot of the derivatives on the top right here. And for our surface, there's about 9% of the total surface that was at or above 45 degrees. And the significance of this is like, if you have a surface and you shine light in normal and it hits a 45 degree angle, then it can scatter all the way out to 90 degrees or in other words, the surface can scatter at pretty much any angle above it. And so we can also design these spatial frequency cutoffs to be on the same order of the wavelength that we're trying to scatter. So in our case, it's like roughly 100 gigahertz or so. So we want our surface features to be a, a few millimeters in wavelength. And with these surfaces, we can also control the amplitude. And we found that having an RMS of 1.78 works pretty well for what we're trying to accomplish. So our next step in all this was to actually start simulating the surface. <clears throat> we did this by making a 3D model of our random surface. And then we run that into ray tracing. So this arrow is pointing, this little line here is kind of an edge on view to our surface. And what we're doing is sending in a bunch of rays and they're scattering off. And the way that we look at how these are scattering is we surround our whole setup with this big hemispherical detector. And I should say that we're in ray tracing. We're working on the infinite frequency limit. And I'll talk about the artifacts of that later on. We also want to be working in the large ray limit because we're limited in our detector resolution. We have 720 pixels radially and roughly 720 pixels uh, annularly. So we want to make sure that all pixels have a good opportunity to get hit by one of these rays. But because our 3D models that we use in here aren't infinitesimally fine that there is some like geometric patterning on the surface just by the nature of STLs. So we had to do some smoothing to it. We chose two degrees where the rays come in between zero and two degrees and that kind of smooths out these artifacts. But the results from the ray tracing can be seen on the top right. This is what that hemisphere saw. It's kind of the heat map. We are right in the center. Our rays that bounced right back up to the pole and around the edges are rays that scattered out pretty close to 90 degrees. And this plot down below it is just a different way of looking at this hemisphere um, with the hemisphere cell. So what we did is we basically took a single slice of this hemisphere and kind of spun it around and averaged it to generate this. But we can see that the surface does scatter pretty uniformly and out to pretty large angles. So after that, we actually want to look into manufacturing the surface. Um, so we started by making a six inch by six inch 3D print of it which we then ran through a 10 ton press. And we found that uh, aluminum 1100 alloy works for us. We used sheet rubber, uh, spray on wax, coupled with the correct thickness of the metal to, to make a good surface. 
we found that not using the right kinds of rubber or wax of the correct thickness led to cracking in the material where the metal would just shear itself apart under the press. But using, whether it be like a, a hand press or rollers, uh, provides a good option for upscaling and mass producing of the surfaces. So once the surfaces are made, we want to experimentally measure the scattering. So we do that by using a microwave source imaged here on the bottom. It's a gun oscillator. We can change the frequency between uh, roughly 75 and 110 gigahertz or so. And it shines a coherent beam at our sample. This is a six inch by six inch. This was just a flat aluminum plate that I was using at the time. And the scattered beam bounces back and it hits this diode receiver, which is sent off to a lock-in. And the whole diode is mounted to the swing arm and there's a protractor here. So we can measure the scattering intensity as a function of the angle. And I want to also mention that our sample is mounted on this like wedge standoff so that we can discriminate the reflection of like from the actual sample and the, the backing. Even though our backing is really microwave absorbing, we just want to take extra precautions when looking at our signal reflections. But in our experimental setup, compared to the ray tracing, we're only seeing a part of the picture. So on the bottom right is that, that hemisphere that I showed during ray tracing. And when we swing our, our diode around, we're only looking at a single cut in this hemisphere. And, and the results of that are shown here. I did sweeps at 80, 90, and 104 gigahertz. And you can see these aren't those smooth lines from ray tracing that I was showing earlier. And that's for a number of reasons. Um, I first want to talk about these peaks and valleys. They are likely caused by an interference pattern. Since in ray tracing, we're working in the infinite frequency limit. Here, we're clearly working at finite frequencies, so we expect to see some artifacts of that. And you'll also kind of see that this has more of a Gaussian-like drop-off to it as compared to our, our more linear um, plot from before. And I'll talk about that in a bit as well. I would also like to mention that for the different frequencies, the Gauss oscillator outputs different powers. And so these are all normalized to roughly the same uh, values, just so we could see the general trends that so were going on. So when I scanned at 104 gigahertz, I decided to put on a flat aluminum plate to simulate a specularly reflecting material. And you can see that there's this huge, huge spike here in the data from where the aluminum just bounces back to the light. <laughs> And it's a super narrow peak. But when you compare that to the, the scattering surfaces, they do a really good job of kind of distributing out that power and scattering that out to fairly large angles. So next, I want to talk about the actual differences between the simulation and the experiments. In the top right is an image of the experimental data overlaid with the ray tracing results. And I'll talk about why there are two lines there in a second. But you can see that generally, um, the experimental data matches pretty closely with the uh, ray tracing results. Um, again, there are some discrepancies from the interference pattern, but there, there's this drop in power starting to get out at, at really large angles. And we think that that is likely due to differences between the actual model surface and the manufactured surface. And I'll talk about that in the next slide. But I'd also like to point out that the ray tracing results, if we look at the red line, it, it's really smooth. But if we were to look at like the individual slices on this hemisphere from ray tracing, each of those individual scans, even in this more ideal setup, are, are pretty noisy. So as soon as we can get more averaging of the data going on, we can get smoother approximations to it. So there were some differences between our model surface and the manufactured surface that we think are contributing to that drop in power at the really large angles. <clears throat> These are, well, I, I went to ThinkBox and I used the 3D scanning arm that they have to scan our manufactured surface and generate a 3D file of that. And the top surface here is our model one, and the one below it is our manufactured one. And even by eye, you can see that the model is a little bumpier than the manufactured surface. We think that that is due to the act of pressing, kind of acting as a low pass filter, where once the aluminum is pressed over the 3D printed surface and lifted up, the aluminum actually relaxes a little bit, which causes some smoothing of the features. We did find that the RMS of the two surfaces generally agree and, and are pretty close. So despite this smoothing, 
uh, the feature sizes are pretty similar. And if we look at the plot of the derivatives, um, like I said before, 9% of the surface from our model was at or above 45 degree facet, so it can scatter out to those really large angles, whereas only 3% of the manufactured surface is at or above 45 degrees. So while it still has those, those steep angles, less power will make it out to those large angles. And that kind of shows itself in the ray tracing results. So the plot on the left here is one that I showed before. This is from our model surface. It's very clearly uniform and out to these large angles. And this is the ray tracing from the 3D model of the manufactured surface. And it's pretty clear by eye that it is still uniform, but it lacks those really large angle um, scattering properties. And, and the, the plots reflect that. Again, these plots are made from just taking a slice of this hemisphere, spinning it and averaging it. So we find that there is a bit faster of a drop in power for the manufactured surface. Um, but will the surface still actually work uh, for the purposes that we need? Well, it is fairly uniformly scattering as we've seen in ray tracing. And like if you take averages from our experimental data, it is definitely scattering out to large angles, especially when compared to the like specularly reflecting aluminum example that I showed where we had that one spike that was only two or three degrees wide. And here, this is scattered out to 20, 40 degrees or so. The aluminum surface aren't particularly absorbing nor specularly reflecting, which is something else we're looking for. The surface is very easily parametizable. It's like changing the amplitudes, the spatial frequencies, uh, the, the cutoffs. So that it's very easy to get in there and change the surface for how we want. Using, using presses and cheap aluminum alloys, it's a pretty reproducible solution. And it's also mechanically robust. The 1100 alloy that we used is 11,000 seven inch thick, uh, which seems pretty thin, but for aluminum, it makes it pretty sturdy. So this will likely stand up to whatever Antarctica has to throw at it. So at the current time, uh, this surface is a very strong candidate. But beyond this project, before it gets actually like said and done, installed on the TMA, uh, there need to be more detailed models and simulations on this surface and perhaps others. And there also needs to be finalization on how to actually mount these surfaces to the inside of the TMA, since it's not a very classic surface. It's, it's very bumpy on both sides. And there also needs to be discussions on how to upscale the surfaces since these tiny six inch by six inch samples aren't the most efficient for such a large telescope. So I'd like to thank Professor Rule for his advising and technical guidance, as well as Professor Nagy, um, Ian for his assistance through the project, and also Rick Beharry for his expertise and construction of the hardware. So, so thank you, everyone. If there are any questions, I can do my best to answer them. Yeah, there are questions, just unmute yourself, or you could try putting up your hand and is an icon. All right. I see an applause, I guess, from Gopal. Well, I have a question, Jared. But anytime you say interference pattern, I say, well, Fourier transform it and tell me if the spacing corresponds to something. Uh, does that correspond to the sort of visual ripples on your sample? Yeah, it is related to the, the height differences between like the peaks and the valleys on the surface. Um, yeah, so it is related to that. So you could change those, you change other things too, but then you could modify that interference effect. Uh, yes, but it also kind of shows by shining different frequencies on it because that's it's, yeah, I guess changing the, the heights and the valleys and the surface or changing the frequencies would have kind of changing effects on the interference pattern. Yeah. Okay, other questions? We have time. If not, then I will give you the applause for the class. Thank you. You can stop your share. There you go, Paul. Are you ready? We see your mentors here. Um, yeah, give me a quick second. Okay. Let me just get set up over here. Uh, all right. So, oh, 
Oops, no, I need to do this this way. Share screen. Uh, okay, can you guys see my screen? We can hear you and we can see your screen. Perfect. Give me another quick second. Oops, nope, too far. I'm just gonna move this up here. All right, so we're gonna get started. Okay. Um, hi everyone. My name is Gopal Sundram, and I am here to present to you uh, my senior project, my final report on Hadley Circulus Expansion in relation to greenhouse gas emissions. So first thing I want to talk about is let's introduce what the Hadley cell is. So the Hadley cell is a thermal global atmospheric circulation cell. So let's break that down. Thermal means it carries heat. Global, it's all across the globe. Atmospheric means it stretches to about 10 to 15 kilometers above the Earth's surface. And it is a circulation cell, which means it carries that heat that I mentioned in a loop. Um, so here's a little diagram. There's a little diagram here at the bottom to kind of give a loose representation of what goes on in the Hadley cell. You see the loop over here. Um, so to kind of explain the, the origins of it, the circulation itself exists through the uneven heating of the Earth. The equator uh, ends up getting more heat than the poles would, as we kind of could guess from you know, how cold the poles are and how warm the equator is on, on, on a normal day. Um, but to kind of explain what's actually going on, the hot air from the equator is rising up through the Earth's, you know, obviously the uh, sky up to the clouds, up to about 10 kilometers above the Earth's surface, up to, up to the point where it hits its neutral buoyancy point, where it no longer can rise any further. It kind of says, okay, I'm not gonna, we're not gonna go any further up at this point. But even though it's still sitting there, there is still more hot air that's rising up beneath it. So the air that's sitting up there then gets pushed either north or south, depending on which side of the equator it's on. So if it's on the north side, it'll get pushed north. If it's on, on the south side, it'll get pushed south. The air is then, after about, you know, after it travels to about 30 degrees north latitude and 30 degrees south, 30 degrees south latitude, the air, it has cooled and it started to lose some of its relative humidity. So it starts to sink. It starts to sink around the 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south. And that's that's the common placing is where we have the Hadley cell boundaries. Um, 30 degrees north and south, it starts to sink back down towards the Earth's surface. Um, when it's well, as it sinks down, as it gets back down towards the surface, um, it's cooler now and it's also much drier, which will come into a, a play a little bit later. I'll talk about more about why that's important. But it cools down, it dries down, it dries, and then it, it starts to come back towards the equator once it comes down towards the Earth's surface. So you can kind of see there's these like little arrows here pointing in the direction, but they're also curved for the reason that once it, it wants the cold, dry air wants to rush back down towards the equator so that it can heat up again, basically. And it's got this curve because of the Coriolis effect. And the really interesting thing is that also is what's helped created those east-west trade winds. So the two big things that we know for sure is that it's established these trade winds. It's also really, really important because I mentioned that it's very dry air it's really, really important for controlling precipitation levels. And I'll kind of get into more about that in a bit. Um, so what, what exactly am I doing? So the project that I'm doing is a computational slash data analysis project. So I'm using Python, specifically the JupyterLab interface, which we're gonna learn in Physics 250, shout out Professor Kopi. Um, and here in the bottom right corner, we have a little snippet of the code that I have been using for the past year at this point. So this is kind of just a little bit of what, you know, most people have an experimental setup. What I have is I have code. Um, and so what really the concrete uh, analysis that I'm doing is I'm doing a data analysis of the clouds and Earth's radiant energy systems series, outgoing long wave radiation data, which is basically the radiation that's coming up from the Earth's surface and the National Centers for Environmental Protection, NCEPs, surface surface data. So the big mathematical backbone for what I'm doing is I've created a atmospheric water vapor feedback model using this one layer Kind of atmosphere idea. Uh, you can kind of see this one layer energy balance model over here in the bottom of the corner. It was super important in helping uh, me and Professor Taylor develop this this one this one uh, layer model. Um, the key really will rely on the deviations from the model. One of the big reasons why. So one of the other things that, that I that isn't on here that I should mention is in this water vapor feedback model we have incorporated carbon concentration. So we've incorporated climate sensitivity, where we can we double the amount of CO two ppm and see what happens. To the, um, to the model itself. Um, so that's how we kind of have this link to greenhouse gases. And once again, I'll kind of get more into that in a bit. But what, what I want to do is I want to take a step back actually and talk about why this project is important. 
So as I mentioned, the Hadley cell is a major climate driving force for the tropics and subtropics, zero to 30, basically. Um, the poleward border of the Hadley cell, as I said, is a significantly dry region across the world. It's actually really interesting. If you look, you'll see at 30 degrees north, you have Central America, which has a decent amount of desertous regions, along with some, with some, some jungle regions, but it also has the Sahara Desert, the Middle East, Northern India, and all these places are very, very, very dry regions. They're all deserts. And then on the other side, on the south side, you have the outback, and you also have the Atacama. So it's very clear that, at least on these poleward boundaries, the Hadley cell is having a major impact on the climate and what drives those regions. Um, and then also, I, you could also even say towards the uh, zero degree side, the, on the side where there's a little bit more uh, moisture, you have the Amazon rainforest, you have the Central African uh, jungles, you also have areas like around, you'll see this more when I, when I pull up the graphs, um, you have areas around Indonesia which are also very prone to flooding. The other thing, a reason why I want to put this out there is why it's project significant. In the bottom right corner here is a graph that uh, I have taken from Cole, a Cole and Cronin paper from 2019, which is a paper published by these two guys from MIT, which showed that if you actually do the same sort of analysis that I'm doing, you temperature versus OLR, you get a linear sort of curve. And we're not really seeing that. So the data on the left is actually what I'm getting. We're not seeing that because what they're doing is they're taking clear sky data. So they're only taking data where there are no clouds. But what, what uh, Professor Taylor and I kind of thought about was like, wait, what if we decided to look at all sky, where there are clouds, where there is basically moisture, where there's going to be rain and moisture? How is that going to make a difference? So what we did is we did that and we, we compared this black, this black curve as our model, our, our mean projection model for what we think for what at a given temperature, what the OLR should be. Um, and then all these blue points are the, is the data. So it doesn't exactly work for the polar regions, but that's because we're really just trying to look at this region up here, which is where the Hadley cell really will be taking effect. So as I mentioned earlier, what's really important isn't just the model itself, but the deviations from this model. So for example, uh, at 300 degrees Kelvin, we can see, yeah, 300 degrees Kelvin, we can see that we should have around a, a OLR of around 250 watts per meter squared. But clearly there's a relatively big range around that. We see that it definitely goes through that point, but there's a big range of points around there. And what we want to see is, you know, where are the points that are more than 5% away from that? Where are the points that are more than 7.5%, 10%, stuff like that. So that's where the kind of uh, the first steps that I took were. And the first things that I really saw was this. This was the, the basis of what I was looking at. I was like, okay, this makes sense. I can see that there's this band about 7.5%, if you look at 7.5% above the model prediction, there's very clearly a band that stretches across you know, around the 30 degree mark across the globe. Same thing around, around zero, not exactly at zero, but around zero, you can see there is this blue, this blue patch that's below it as well. Now there are also some uh, excess blues and reds across, especially across around here, but I'm mostly focusing in on this area in particular. And I thought this was like, okay, this is a good place to start. Let me see if I can get these 20 years worth of data and do a real data analysis on it. So that's kind of, so really, the goals of what I was trying to do is employ a model based on those simple parameters, OLR and surface temperature, and then use that model to determine the expansion of the Hadley cell using two different methods, overall area expansion and border width expansion. So with that in mind, I set out to kind of set, uh, find those goals. So I started with the border width expansion was the first thing I wanted to do. So I collected and I analyzed the past 20 years worth of data. I started my analysis by making a function that would take five inputs. Um, which month am I am I looking at? Which month am I kind of analyzing? Which points do I want to take into consideration? So how far away from the new projection model is an acceptable amount? The deviation. Um, where does the equator side bound lie? So where do, I, where do I want to say, okay, I don't want to take any more of the blue points beyond a certain amount of latitude. I said, I think I said 20 was, was where I said, it. okay, I want to make sure I catch everything in between 20 degrees north and 20 degrees south just to be safe. And I said, what is an acceptable region for the red, red, red points, for the poleward boundary? Um, and I said for that, that actually took two inputs because you needed a lower side and an upper side, which is why I said that it would take five inputs there. So I started with this analysis and my results were not exactly what I wanted to see. Now, what, is, what does this graph exactly mean? So on the x-axis here, we have uh, a time uh, axis we see for years from March of 2000. We have going from March, data from March of 2000 to March of 2020. On the, oops, 
that says spoiler. Um, on the left side here, we have, on the y-axis, we have the Hadley cell width. So we have from, we see that around 20 to 23 degrees is about where we're seeing this north Hadley cell. I only did the north one because I said, okay, this, there's something that I'm missing here because the blue points represent the uh, data month by month. And the black curve here is over the year. The black curve is relatively steady. There isn't too much of a border expansion over the past 20 years. And I'm thinking, maybe there's something that I'm not exactly seeing here. Maybe there's something that I'm, I might be doing wrong, or maybe I need to take a look at something at a bigger picture. Because all I was really seeing when I was running this code was I was just seeing the results. I wasn't really seeing what the process was like. So um, what I decided to do was I tracked it. I tracked the, due to these inconclusive results from the method that I was using, I decided to make these animations to get a better sense of what I was looking at. And this, this is what by far one of my favorite parts of, of, of what I've done. Uh, because you get to see just kind of, oh, I hope it gets to go fast. Okay, cool. Um, you get to see just how fluid really the borders are for one thing, which is where I made my initial mistake was having the strict boundaries. I needed to have fluid boundaries, or at least one that encapsulated how far north some of these go and how far you know they change. You can kind of see over the course of the year how it just flows back and forth. You can see in the summer months, it takes out California and a lot of the West Coast actually. And in the summer months, it's a little tough to see here because it's going a little quickly, but in the summer months, it also comes and extends up into, into Southern Europe. And one of, the, one of the biggest things that helped me realize that I, I was on the right track in terms of the determining the fact of the, the determining the Hadley cell borders themselves was the fact that, or at least determining the fact that we, I could see the dry and the, and the moist areas correctly was that, uh, was India actually. India was actually a huge indicator for me personally. Because one thing I know is that uh, India has really, really dry periods and also really, really wet periods. So I went and I tracked them down. And I saw that during the months of March and April, it's just covered, covered in this, these, these uh, above, temp, above seven and a half percent regions where it's supposed to, it really should be really dry. And then you see this kind of rush of the blue patch come in towards India. And what was interesting is that's during, during like June and July, which is peak monsoon season where everything just gets flooded and wet. So I was like, okay, I know I'm on the right track here when, in terms of determining these boundaries, but I need to make sure that I can track the borders here uh, effectively. But the next thing I really wanted to do, so I saw this and I said, okay, cool. Let me break this down month by month. So I thought the two that were interesting enough for me to show was March and September. March, because you could get a really good sense of the of the bands here. I thought the bands were really nice to see. Also, March was the kind of one that I initially started out with because it's close to the yearly average anyway. Um, so you could get definitely get a good sense of the bands that are kind of passing around around here. And then I put September in as well for everyone to see because you could kind of see as the years go on, this kind of invasion into Southern Europe, which is bad because if you really think about, you know, what a dry spell means for a region like Southern Europe, it means that the agriculture, like, you know, Italy and Greece, all those areas that have lush fertile lands, if they go dry, that's a problem for the agriculture and the economy of all those regions and parts of the world really in, in essence as well. So it's really important to understand the fact that these, they can lead to potential problems. Um, so those are the two that I wanna make sure that everyone got a chance to see right now. Uh, and also the other thing that I think was important was a visualization of what the different deviations represent. So. Um, what here you can see is 1%, 2%, 5%, 7.5%, 10%, and 12.5%. You see kind of how it changes over the course of that, because then you can see it's going to be important for when I kind of discuss the results that I get from each of the deviations. Um, and changing the percent even by 2.5% isn't, you don't see that much of a difference, but it gradually over time, it really does make a difference. Um, so now I'm going to go into the results that I have for the overall area expansion. So, um, they also ended up being remarkably periodic, like remarkably so. You can see here that the, these these they got this this really nice the, the south of the cell obviously is a little it's a little bit larger I'd say. Um, you got these uh, really large peaks that are quite consistent actually. There's a little there's a little bit of a change at, at the tops, not as much at the bottoms um, for the south. Have they some particular? But I'd say uh, for the south, this has been a relative increase since 2000. You can see there's a little bit of a trend up, up, up goes down a little bit, but then it still ends up in a higher place than it began. The North Hadley Sun, on the other hand, is quite erratic. For overall and overall area expansion, it goes up, it goes down, it's kind of all over the place, but there's some secondary analysis that, that needs to be done here for sure when it comes to how steep these peaks are, how quickly they change, can that impact the uh, aforementioned areas that might be in trouble? It's something 
thing to consider for sure um, in terms of the dry expansion. So that's kind of part one. Part two is I looked at the the kind of the, the blue areas, the, the areas that are known to be moist. And once again, you see this periodic trend here, but it's not changing. It's the, the overall overall trend isn't really changing that much. It also, just like with the, the dry areas, experienced a spike in the early 2000s, uh, 2010, excuse me. Um, but this periodic behavior is most certainly noticeable, which is cool. I, I think that's a really that's a really cool thing. You can kind of see that when it was, it was going back and forth too, that there's definitely this periodic behavior. Um, so um, what I wanted to also show is that there's this overall air expansion. I wanted to show you like what the difference of the deviations were. And at first I got here because they're actually between 5%, 7.5%, 10% so we really get a sense of the bands. It, they look the same. And I was scared at first when I saw it, I was like, oh no, these are all the same, just at different amounts. But no, there are some minute changes between the three, between the three, so I know that there is something going on, but they're still the same periodic trends. It does not make that much of a difference, which is kind of interesting. But there is, there's still some stuff to be, to be taken from there, which is good. Um, so I, you know, there, there, there's some positive to be taken from this, but well, there are also some things that I was a little, that there are a little inconclusive. Um, so then also I did some results for the border width expansion. Um, so this, this is kind of the same idea. There is a periodic expansion noted here uh, when it comes to the border width here. On um, the South Hadley cell is noticeably larger than the North one. Um, it is also a little bit smaller than I would have imagined. And I think I know why that is. I think it's it's due to where we're placing the equator side bound as well, in terms of like, it's like, oh, it's now start, starting at like five degrees versus like maybe some, what time is starting at zero degrees. So I, I think I can understand why this might be happening, but there's also there's a little bit of a trend here in the Southern Hadley. So there's some notable kind of peak expansion, I, I'd say, I think at some point you can see, especially in the later years, you're starting to get a little bit more of that. There's some, there's some dips there. Um, okay. So that's kind of where I was at with my results. So the conclusions that I, I wanted, hold on one second. The conclusions that I kind of want to draw from this are that you know the results that I'm going after are quantified using those goals that I mentioned earlier in particular. So I would say that we were successful in, in, in our goal of employing a simple model based on two parameters to determine the Hadley cell boundaries over the past 20 years. On the other hand, the results are a little bit more inconclusive for a Hadley cell boundary uh, expansion on the whole. There are some interesting factors like the North Hadley cell expansion into late summer into Southern Europe, and the South Hadley cell having a relatively small but still notable increase in size. But the thing that, that I think is really important is that this is only over 20 years. This is because we've only been able to collect really 20 years worth of good data on, on, this, on this front, for example, for especially for outgoing long of radiation. 20 years on the overall scale of the earth is basically like a millisecond. There is almost it's almost like a blink of an eye. And I know we're trying to kind of account for the fact that greenhouse gas emissions have really kind of shot over the past 20 years, but it's still going to be kind of a slow moving train. Um, I think it'll be really, really interesting for us to come back to this project in like five to 10 years when there's more uh, detailed data too, for that matter, and get a sense to see if there has been more of an increase or if it stayed the same, it'll just be good to see with more data. So I'd like to thank you all for listening. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge Professor Taylor, my research mentor. I would not have been able to do, go anywhere on this project without his help. He's been instrumental. I'd like to thank Pram and Iggy. Um, when we first started out in the summer, they helped develop the first parts of the code that I've been using. They've also been great for helping me debug and just helping me to hang out when I'm trying to do work. I'd like to acknowledge Professor Chotner, the 352 class, and all the guests for listening in on this talk. Okay questions and there was one in the chat. David, do you want to unmute yourself and ask it directly? Uh, sure. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, you've shown us Hadley cell with the updraft tropical, but this uh, tropical part changes seasonally. Do you account for this seasonal change? Uh, the tropical part, uh, you mean in terms of, what do you mean? What right. do you mean? Latitude changes seasonally, of course, from summer. Ah. Yes. yes, yes, yes. So actually, to be honest with you, we did not take that as much into account when, in terms of, um, you know, where exactly on the Earth's surface that latitude is taking place. But it also right. doesn't matter as much for this particular part because if we're taking the overall border expansion, we're still taking the the uh, average of where the points are. Not necessarily where exactly right. where the latitudes are. If you take the average of where the points are, it won't necessarily matter, it matter if the latitudes are changing in particular. And then it's the same thing for overall area expansion because we're not necessarily looking at 
where their point, uh, where their points are. We're just looking at how many points there are. So it isn't necessarily as critical a factor as um, you might you might think it would be when we're looking at just kind of at the numbers. Okay. Other questions? I have one. If there aren't any, but oh, questions. I have a question too. Um, yeah. This is a quicker one. If you go back to your diagrams, I notice in a lot of them that you appear on with a map. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, um, I noticed that there's these like lines, and I was just wondering if oh. you knew where the where what that artifact is representing. Yeah, it's just it's just Cartopie, the the thing that I was using to. Um, I believe that's what it was. I think it's just the, the package that I used when I I, I translated onto the world map. It had these little lines there. At first, I thought it might have represented like this might represent the prime meridian, and actually, this one might for that matter. Um, but this. This one here at first, I was like, oh, is this maybe the equator line? But I believe it is a little too high for it to be the equator line. So I think it's just a, a card pie thing. Um, but this one right here, the, the, the one in the middle over here, I think could potentially represent the prime meridian. Not entirely sure. But they don't like represent gaps in data or anything. No, 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 no. no. Okay. So any other questions? The one I want to ask is maybe really unfair and beyond the scope of your project, but I'm curious whether you can say anything about whether human activities might cause dangerous changes. For example, you mentioned CO2, but also chopping down the Amazon rainforest. Could you give any insight about those? Well, I mean, those, you know, the, like the, the things, I don't think in particular, I'm at the point where I can make a conclusion about that. I think that'd be overstepping the data a little bit. But I, I, I think, I don't think it'd be remiss to say that that would have an impact on, you know, the temperature, or like the amount, amount of open long radiation the Earth's surface is giving off, along with because what the other the other factors that you need to take into account when it comes to overall carbon emissions are land use change. So if you are to raise the Amazon forest, you are taking away trees, which will then impact the amount of carbon that's going into our atmosphere. So like yes, that would, but that's not exactly in the scope of what I'm looking at right now. Well, not just the carbon in the atmosphere, but the moisture is what I was thinking of. Oh yeah, yeah, that too. I mean. Mm -hmm. I don't think I can draw a conclusion, but yes, I, I would think that would have an impact there. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, if not, then thank you, Gopal. And you can stop your screen share and her line when you're ready. Okay, I can see your uh, slide, but you have to say something, so. Yes, hello, can you hear me? Okay, we can hear you now. You're fine, right, go great. ahead. All right, hello everyone. I'm presenting on flashback galaxies as a potential cause of galaxy assembly bias. Um, so to start off, to talk about um, sort of the, the galaxy halo connection. Uh, in our universe, um, we, we expect there to be a, an underlying dark matter structure um, that is uh, unobservable. Um, but we can still, uh, and, and sort of that be an image of what that dark matter might look like is given on the left here. Um, the sort of this big web of, of uh, dark matter halos. Um, but what we can see is baryonic matter, stars and galaxies, and it's of interest uh, to be able to sort of find some sort of relation between the distribution of baryonic matter and the properties of, of dark matter um, so that we can learn more about what dark matter might look like in our, in our universe. Um, and so this type of relation is called the galaxy halo connection. Um, this image on the on, on the right here are sort of the what are, are the, the stars and, and galaxies, um, and sort of, so I would sort of overlie this this uh, this dark matter distribution. Um, and it's specifically of interest to be able to to be able to have a relation for uh, what what is the the halo mass of of, of, dark, of dark matter um, as a as a function of um, sort of uh, uh, galaxy clustering statistics. Um, so as as a function of how many galaxies are inside of, of a dark matter halo. Um, and so such a relation, um, when, when plotted, is called a halo occupation distribution. Or a halo occupation function, and uh, in, in this left image here, I have an example of one of these. Um, there's a, a lot of a lot of different uh, trends being plotted here for for different uh, different types of galaxies and different types of, of, of uh, halos. 
I'll get, I'll cover each of them in a bit, but just basically to start off, you have on, on the Y here, the expected number on the, on the Y axis here, you have the expected number of galaxies inside of, of, of a halo um, and given as a function of, a, of the halo mass. You can see there's sort of a characteristic rise that occurs um, with, with larger halo mass. Um, and then, and again, in these different these different uh, these different trend lines that are given, um, you have solid lines that give the trend lines for that, that give trends for the uh, an entire galaxy an entire um, galaxy population, uh, and, and then you uh, also have these these dashed lines that give the trend lines for um, central galaxies that occupy the the center of halos. And finally, you have uh, these other dashed lines here that give the trends for satellite galaxies that populate the space within halos sort of surrounding, surrounding the central galaxy. Um, and so, so, that's, so those, are the, those are the divisions based upon um, galaxy type. You can, also, um, you can also divide this data based upon um, sort of galaxies found in, in uh, the earliest formed halos or the latest formed halos. So that's what's plotted in um, in the red and blue here, um, red for the earliest form, blue for the later formed, or for the latest formed. Uh, and what's what's interesting about um, about that case is you focus on the on the solid black, um, red and blue lines. Is that looking at um, earlier formed halos, gal galaxies in earlier formed halos versus galaxies in later formed halos, the the shape of the function changes a little bit. Um, and what what this this change indicates is that the the relation bet um, between galaxy clustering statistics and and dark and dark matter properties is actually a multi-parameter relation. It's not simply um, it's not simply gal galaxy clustering as a function of halo mass. There are these other these other secondary parameters here here uh, being uh, halo formation time that impact the relation. Uh, so this this complicates the, uh, the the description of the galaxy halo relation. Uh, and and these these secondary parameters apart from the secondary halo parameters uh, apart from halo mass um, that have that have an impact that their effect is called galaxy assembly bias. Um, so here here the assembly bias parameter is halo formation time, but there are other ones as well, such as um, sort of uh, um, halo environment and halo concentration uh, that that have similar effects on on, on the on the halo on, on these halo occupation functions. Um, and to go back to what this all actually looks like uh, in, in physical space, we look at the, the right image here. Um, on on the, the, biggest, the biggest box here is sort of a, a spatial distribution of, of uh, sort of all halos within a, within a certain confined region. Um, so again, kind of like the cosmic web of, of halos. Um, but if you look at the two smaller panels uh, beside it, uh, in, in red, here's the, that population of the 20% earliest formed halos and in blue, the 20% the latest form tailors. Uh, so you can see that, that the clustering um, physically looks different and that, uh, that again goes back to how um, these, these, are, these secondary parameters, the galaxy assembly bias parameters really do impact um, the galaxy clustering. Um, so uh, it's, it's of interest then to ask, well, what are, what are the, what's the physical explanation behind why this galaxy assembly bias occurs? And the proposal um, in this project was to look at splashback galaxies as a potential explanation. Um, so what, what are splashback galaxies? Um, to put it simply, it's a galaxy that uh, performs a flyby maneuver around a larger nearby host galaxy or, or, or host sort of cluster of galaxies. Right? So you have the, the, the structure, uh, the cosmological structure of the universe is dynamic. You have uh, all this gravitational interaction that's bringing in um, galaxies, bringing it into sort of dense regions of galaxy clusters or massive or sort of massive central galaxies. And these infalling galaxies will sometimes interact with with these these big hosts in such a way that they actually perform a flyby maneuver around the host. Um, so the left image here is just sort of a bunch of infalling galaxies coming in on, on, a, on a big um, central cluster. And then uh, the, the right image is just a sort of di a diagram of what a, a flyby looks like, um, a flyby maneuver here given with a, a spacecraft going around a planet, but it would be something very similar for a, a splashback galaxy going around a, a, host, uh, a host galaxy. 
um, you'd have, you know, it, it comes within the, the sphere of influence of the, uh, of the host and then leaves. And in a bit more tactical, in a bit more tactical terms, the, the sphere of influence for a for a the host galaxy is the galaxy's uh, uh, burial radius. Um, so, with sort of an understanding of what splashback galaxies are, um, this project was then proposing them uh, and sort of the unique interactions that they have with, with their hosts as a as a potential physical origin for galaxy assembly bias. Um, now, to actually start off the project, uh, had to um, identify splashbacks with um, with, simu with uh, simulation data. Um, we were using um, data from the Millennium simulation, so um, the sort of the uh, dark matter and body simulation. Um, and um, built on top of that, we had a, a semi-analytic model of galaxy formation. This is um, stuff that we didn't do ourselves. This is pre-existing. A uh, big, big collection of sort of simulation data that is um, really commonly used in, in these sorts of studies, um, but uh, we, we used that data and analyzed it to um, the, the first thing that I did was specifically was to identify which which um, galaxies in in this in the semi analytic model of galaxy evolution are are splashbacks. Um, we and then we adopted a definition from a previous paper um, that looked at splashback galaxies as a potential cause of halo assembly bias, a phenomenon that is distinct from but related to galaxy assembly bias. Um, and that was actually one of one the fact that um, that that paper found um, that found splashbacks to be responsible for halo assembly bias was actually one of the the origins of, of our kind of intuition that maybe they would also be responsible for galaxy assembly bias. Um, but we used that paper's definition. Um, we looked at galaxies um, that have to meet three different uh, conditions to be considered a splashback. One, the the host uh, the host galaxy's halo must still exist at the sort of present time of analysis in the simulation. Um, and two, the 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 this present host um, must uh, this present the host's present halo must not be within the real radius of the um, of the splashback's own uh, present halo. Um, this is just again because uh, the splashbacks are expected to interact with these halos and with these hosts and then fly off. Um, and then finally, the the present um, the present host halo must have a larger mass than the the present splashbacks halo. Um, so with these three conditions adapted from the previous paper, I, I implemented this um, to, as a as a filter using Python to just identify uh, which galaxies would be splashbacks. And the results for that are, are given here, sort of in a, in a, in a spatial distribution plot for a certain region. Uh, I've, I've plotted um, the, the central galaxies in blue, uh, and then specifically the splashbacks uh, in red. Um, so the splashbacks uh, appear uh, in, 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 more, in sort of denser regions, which makes sense as they are, they, they are galaxies that interact with, with their neighbors, and they're going to have more interactions in denser regions. Um, so once that phase of the project was complete, um, the the next step was to uh, sort of attempt um, the, the sort of the main hypothesis of this project, which is that uh, perhaps the splashbacks are actually misidentified satellites of the of the host halos that they interacted with, and if we sort of reassign them as, as satellite galaxies of these host halos, then maybe the assembly bias signals will actually will go down then. Um, and, and so some, some of the some of the galaxy assembly bias signal might actually be sort of an extraneous signal due to a misclassification of these galaxies. Um, so on, on the on the left image here, I, ha I have a halo occupation function that I made, um, sort of similar to the one I showed before. I have these solid lines that show the trends for uh, with a black line for the the full galaxy sample, and then the 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 10% least, uh, so the, the galaxy that we bias parameter I use in this plot was an environmental parameter. So I have in blue, in a blue line here for the 10% the um, least dense, so galaxies in the 10% least dense environments, and a red line for galaxies in the 10% um, most dense environments. And again, you can see with these solid lines, there's again this, this, this difference in the shape of the functions for the red versus the, the, the solid red versus the solid blue line. Um, so that, that indicates the presence of, of galaxy assembly bias. Um, but once I did the reassignment procedure where I, I treated the splashbacks as if they were satellites of their hosts, 
Um, now we have this sort of this dashed blue line and this dashed red line for the, the reassignment trends. Now there's much less difference um, at, at, at uh, low halo masses for, for those trend lines. Um, so that indicates um, some level of, of improvement there that's occurring due to, um, due to this reassignment procedure. Um, and we were also curious, thinking that perhaps the, 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 uh, the galaxy assembly bias signals at, at, at a larger halo masses would also improve, um, but we didn't really see that um, here in this plot. They, the differences in, in the red versus the blue lines sort of prevailed even after reassignment. Um, and then the, the right plot here is a very similar plot, um, except that I'm using a different um, assembly bias parameter. Instead of, uh, in, instead of halo environment, I'm looking at um, sort of halo concentration. Um, but the very similar stuff going on, the, the, the dashed lines that, re, that represent reassignment, um, are, the, their behavior is, is, has less difference than, than the solid lines um, pre-reassignment, uh, specifically at low halo masses. Um, so to, to further um, sort of look at these results and think about them, we had an additional test, which was to, um, to look at correlation function ratios. Um, and the idea here is that you can get a very good measure of the degree of assembly bias present with a galaxy sample by taking the ratio of a correlation function of your, of your galaxy sample um, to, a, to a similar sample where they're Built, that is built to have no assembly bias present. Uh, and and the, the idea with that is that if the ratio of, of those two functions is very close to unity, that means there's very little assembly bias. Whereas if the ratio strays from unity, that means there's, there's more, difference between the, more, more difference between the assembly bias free sample and the sample with assembly bias, indicating that the assembly bias uh, itself is, is uh, more significant. Um, so I, I made these these ratio plots with a couple different um, for a couple of different cases. Um, one in in the case of uh, just having having this ori this original this original full sample of, of galaxies, no, no special treatment done to that. And that's given with this with this uh, black line here. And then I had the the reassigned case where we um, we were this, this reassignment procedure I was talking about before. Uh, that's given with a red, a red line here. And then finally, a comparison case where the splat, rather than reassigning the splashbacks, they are removed from um, the simulation entirely. And that's given um, with, with a, a blue line here. And I did this for uh, 10, so there's uh, some calculating these correlation function ratios with some inherent, ran there's some inherent randomness in this. So I, did, so I did this with 10 different seeds and, and averaged them. So that's why you can see sort of this scatter that's present. Um, but what's significant here is that the, the reassignment doesn't seem to significantly affect um, the, the, uh, assemb the assembly bias level, um, which is kind of surprising because before we were looking at those hero occupation um, functions, functions and we're thinking, oh, there, there is something, there is some level of, of improvement going on here. Um, but with this test, um, that, that improvement wasn't uh, wasn't really present, but what but what was uh, sort of coming off as an improvement here is when we looked at just the case of removing the splashbacks. Um, there, here, there was a, a quite a significant drop in the in the level of assembly bias. And so we thought, well, um, we, we eventually came to think, well, maybe the the assignment procedure isn't um, is it doesn't work doesn't sort of remedy the issue exactly as as we had hoped it would. Um, but perhaps there is still perhaps there is still something to the idea of splashbacks um, being related to uh, galaxy assembly bias, and um, that can be seen just the fact that removing them um, leads to some level of improvement. However, we also have to be careful because when, in the case where we're just removing splashbacks, um, we are changing the number density of the simulation, and changing the number density of the simulation is is itself expected to change the level of assembly bias somewhere. So it could be that that is a that effect is actually what's causing this drop, and that it's not really um, it's not really uh, it's, not, that it's not really linking splashbacks in any special way to um, to, uh, to to galaxy assembly bias. So as a, as a sort of a final check. Um, to, to investigate uh, if, if there was something special going on with splashbacks, we decided to uh, create one more trend line to add to this plot, basically, where instead of removing splashbacks, 
we would remove um, just low mass, we would, we would remove low mass, um, low, low stellar mass galaxies. Uh, and, and we would remove a, a number of them that was equal to the number of splashbacks in the simulation, um, thus changing the, the number density of the simulation uh, in a similar way to removing splashbacks. So this comparison would allow us to see if the, if the change in splashbacks was really due to, to, due to a special feature of the splashbacks or if it was due to um, just changing the, the number density. So that's given in this plot and some of the colors have changed. So I'll go over all of these, all of these again. And I apologize to anyone with um, red, green color blindness. I didn't choose these colors very well, um, but I'll hopefully I'll go over with each of them with my cursor to, to um, explain this. So, Again, the, the black line here is the, 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 original, the original sample. Um, no, nothing special done to the splashbacks. Um, then the, the red line here now is um, having removed low stellar mass, low stellar mass uh, galaxies, which leads to a, a slight decrease, um, a, a very slight decrease, um, but nothing, nothing nearly as significant as in the case of the blue line here, which is removing splashbacks. Um, and finally, again, the carried over the green line here is, is the reassignment case that didn't, uh, that didn't lead to an improvement. Um, and in this case, I, I have, since this is a, a relatively new reply, I've only averaged uh, two, two random seeds. So that's why the, the error is a little bit more uh, sporadic. But um, what, what should have been indicated here is that splashbacks really do have um, some level of impact on, on galaxy assembly bias, though, although perhaps not in the way we originally thought they, uh, they would, since the reassignment procedure doesn't, um, doesn't also decrease um, the, the, the assembly bias signature. Um, but to come away sort of with the, the conclusion of the project, um, we uh, we, sort of in, we were investigating if, if the splashback galaxies um, could explain were related to galaxy assembly bias. And it seems to this point that that may indeed be the case that they may in some ways um, sort of have a, a significant effect, um, even if it's not as how we initially pictured it. Um, so that is kind of where the project is at now. Um, thank you all for listening. Uh, I'm gonna give acknowledgements. Um, thank you to um, uh, Dr. Edith Zahavi and, and our postdocs, um, Dr. Jazu Zhu and Sergio Contreras, for all their mentorship and uh, helping me out with this project. Um, I'll take questions. Okay, questions. Feel free to unmute yourself. I'm not seeing any questions or any hands up. I guess I've asked my questions during this past year, so I don't have any fresh ones. So if there are no other questions, then you know, I will just thank you for your work and your presentation. Great, thanks. And stop your share. And let's see, uh, for every, uh, our schedule says at two o'clock we break for 10 minutes, it's 2.02 now. The students actually requested a break. I gave them the option. If we were meeting in person, uh, the break would be filled with uh, soda and chips and cookies supplied by the department. I forgot to tell people to bring their own snacks. I brought mine, uh, my cookies. So we'll, uh, I'll, I'll pause the recording, uh, but we'll resume again at 2.10 with Andrew. So Andrew, are you ready to share your screen and get started? Yeah, I'm all ready. Okay, we'll wait until my computer says 2.10 to make sure everyone has a chance to get here on time. Okay. Well, you can start your screen share if you want. Okay, we will do. Okay, we can see it. Okay, cool. And we can hear you. Just give it another few seconds, I think. See if your advisor's here, because she was here earlier. We won't see her now. But it's 2.10, so let's go ahead and get started when you're ready. Okay, sounds good. Okay. Um, sorry, just a sec. All right, hi everyone. Uh, my name is, 
Um, I can like hear a feedback. It might be coming from your uh, computer, Dr. C. Okay. Hi everyone, my name is Andrew and I've been working with Professor Kisley on a project called Expansion Microscopy Using Force. So just as a brief outline of what I'm gonna talk about, so I'm gonna go over the background of this project and I'm gonna talk a little bit about highly stretchable hydrogels that we're using. I'm gonna talk about how we built a stretcher device to stretch gels. And I'm gonna talk about the results of our project, which include predicting gel expansion and verifying the amount of gel strain. Then I'll go over future work and conclusions. So what is expansion microscopy? So expansion microscopy, it's a pretty new, new technique discovered in 2015. And what it is, it's an optical imaging method in which a specimen is expanded prior to imaging to enable super resolution microscopy. And the nice thing about optical imaging methods is that they're usually really compatible with biological specimens. And having a optical imaging method that's also super resolution is really powerful. So expansion microscopy uses a swallowable polymer gel that expands when we add water. And this is what it looks like on the bottom left. And you can see kind of comparing the pre-swollen gel to the post one, it expanded about four times. Um, however, the, the limitations of this is that the maximum expansion that it can achieve is around four times. And you can't get dy dynamic imaging, which means you can't get video of the sample expanding. Um, but as you can see on this figure on the bottom right, you can in increase your resolu resolution of your image dramatically. So as you can see, these are this, um, these are pictures of microtubules, and you can see comparing the pre to the post image. Um, after expansion, you can really easily resolve these fine structures in the between microtubules, and you can kind of see what's going on in Figure D. Is that these microtubules are getting spread apart, and so these Gaussian peaks you can now resolve, as opposed to before when it was just a single peak. Okay, so in this project, we're using force to perform expansion microscopy, and uh, the idea behind that is that we can use equibiaxial strain to expand a sample equally in two dimensions. And this idea has been used before in cyclic structure devices, which are used in um, studies on lung cells where we can study the effect of strain on those cells. Um, it's also used in studies on bone cells. And, and so this has appeared before uh, in the literature and it's seen uses outside of expansion microscopy. Um, and the idea is that we can make a circular gel and then press it over a cylinder of a smaller radius. And then in the middle region, the gel expands uh, equibiaxially. So in one dimension, it kind of looks like this, where you have your gel, circular gel, and you press it up over this black indenting cylinder, and then a little line segment that you have will expand a certain amount. And in 2D, again, you have this gel, and any area that you have will be stretched equally in two dimensions. And the expansion is equibiaxial, which means if we draw an area anywhere on this gel and expand it, then the shape of that will be retained. Uh, and the pros of using force are that we can achieve a higher expansion. We can perform dynamic imaging, and this works for more diverse samples than the traditional method. So in this project, we're using highly stretchable hydrogels. And what these are, are there, um, they are a hybrid of ionic and covalent polymer networks. And so we have a weak ionic network, which we're using alginate, and those crosslinks can unzip and reform. 
And so they kind of act as sacrificial bonds that dissipate energy. And then we also have a strong covalent network. Um, in this case, it's polyacrylamide and it bridges any cracks that forms and stabilizes the deformation. And the nice thing about these hydrogels is they have a really huge fracture strain. So you can stretch them about 20 times before they finally break. Um, and so in this figure on the bottom left, this is a gel that I made in the lab and you can kind of see how we start at like uh, one centimeter uh, width and then we stretch it all the way to about 40 centimeters or sorry, I guess this is more like 30 centimeters. Um, and on average, this is like a 20 times uniaxial stretch in one direction, in one dimension. Um, and then on this figure on the bottom right, this is kind of a closer look at the um, chemical structure of these gels. So we have the ionically bonded alginate, which is held together by these calcium ions. And then we have the covalently bonded polyacrylamide, which is held together by covalent bonds. Uh, here they're green squares. And then in the hybrid gel, we also have, um, again, both the ionic bonds and the covalent bonds, and then also bonds between the two networks, which are these blue triangles. So for our purpose purposes, we are synthesizing gels in pretty large volumes, uh, 10 milliliters. And so I was using um, glass molds. And what I found worked best is to use two sheets of glass and then pour the free gel solution in between the two sheets and then seal the hole afterwards. And that prevented uh, the air bubbles from forming. Um, if you try to do it other ways, then more air bubbles will form. Um, but a nice thing about these gels is that they're not resistant. So if some air bubbles do form, it will not appreciably decrease the fracture strain. And so you can kind of see this um, in the bottom right, I have one of these 10 milliliter volume gels and I'm actually stretching it about 20 times, even though there's like air bubbles in there. Um, so for this project, uh, stretching these gels required some sort of stretcher device. And so what we came up with was this, uh, this device here. So the gel is attached to a moving platform and then it's pressed against an indenting cylinder and that cylinder deforms the gel, which causes it to stretch equibiaxially. We're controlling the moving platform using two stepper motors on either side and we're using an Arduino to control those stepper motors. And the way that we're attaching the gel to the platform is just using these four, four uh, clamps on the edges and sandpaper to increase friction so that the gel doesn't slip. And then we're also coating the indenting cylinder uh, with lubricant. Uh, yeah, so we're controlling the device using Arduino and stepper driver. You can kind of see here how it's mounting to the microscope. And yeah, here's the power supply, Arduino, stepper driver. This is just what it looks like um, in the uh, microscope lab. Cool. Um, so one of the things that we found during this project is that if we assume that the gel is like a neohookian material, um, which is analogous to when you think of like a hookian spring, uh, neo-hookian is like a type of material with ideal properties. Um, we can predict that the expansion will increase exponentially according to this equation here. And another thing of interest is that a smaller indenter will actually induce a greater expansion than a larger indenter. Um, and so we kind of chose the dimensions of our structure device based on this fact. And this graph here is just showing what the expansion factor looks like when we stretch uh, greater and greater distances. You can see there's kind of this exponential stretching relationship. 
And this picture on the right is showing how when we stretch the gel, it first deforms like a truncated cone until a certain point, then it'll just deform as a cylinder, at which point the stretching is um, exponential. Um, then to verify the gel strain, first what we did is we verified it just visually by drawing along the circumference of the indenting cylinder in the fully expanded state. And when it relaxes, then that circle that was originally about 13 millimeters across shrinks down to about one millimeter across, which means that we got about a 10 times expansion. Um, another thing that we did is that we observed the displacements of gel artifacts like air bubbles um, under a microscope to see if we could see the gel stretching equibiaxially at a smaller scale. And indeed, what we saw is that if we stretch the gel like one centimeter, then we see that these air bubbles are moving apart um, with a certain strain. Um, in this example I have down here on the bottom right, the air bubbles had a strain of about 1.1, which is about what we'd expect for uh, just stretching one centimeter. Um, and what we're currently trying to do is using fluorescent beads to verify the homogeneity of strain to a greater precision. Um, because um, again, like using gel artifacts such as air bubbles, um, it's kind of hard to find air bubbles that are like in a good um, confirmation that we can actually use to verify the strain is happening. But at the very least, we know that visually, we know that the gel is expanding about 10 times. So that's good. In the future, what we want to do is use fluorescent beads for a more precise strain or expansion measurement, and then compare that to the um, compare the observed expansion to the analytical um, expectation uh, using the Neohokian model. Another thing that we want to do is improve the method of mounting the gel on the device. Uh, some ways that we could do that is to use a circular groove and an O-ring, which would make it a lot easier to mount the gel. Or we could use a circular clamp with threads on the edges so we could actually screw the gel onto the device. And ultimately what we wanna do is apply this uh, expansion microscopy technique to a biological sample. Um, for example, a cell with focal adhesions. Um, uh, what make focal adhesions a really good candidate is because with this expansion microscopy method, we're only stretching in two dimensions. And focal adhesions are these protein complexes that attach a cell to the extracellular matrix. And so if we place a cell on top of the gel, then we'll have these focal complexes in this 2D plane. And so they'll be um, stretched really well by this technique. And we'll be able to get uh, good images. And again, um, we really want to use these fluorescent beads to get these uh, a more precise strain expansion measurement and to compare it to this uh, anal an analytical model that we have. Um, and what we expect right now to happen is that when the gel is stretched closer to this fracture strain at about 10 times expansion, then the behavior will deviate a lot from the analytical um, expectation. So that's it for my presentation. I'd like to thank my advisor, Professor Kisley, also Rick by Harry for his help with machining and fabrication. I'd like to thank Dr. Anuj Saini for his help operating the microscope and some input on the design. And uh, finally, grad students, uh, Bill and Ricardo, for their assistance in the lab. Uh, so thank you everyone for listening. And uh, if there's time for questions, then I'd be happy to answer. There's time for questions, so you can yeah. answer some. You see we're joined by a former member of the Kisley group, Will. Uh, Walter, go ahead. Uh, yes, 
Nice talk, Andrew. Um, Can you speak thank you. a question about, usually when we talk about elasticity, we have a relation between stress and strain. Or So I was wondering if you've thought about any way to measure the force as well as the strain. Um, that's a really good question. Um, I haven't really. Um, there is a lot of um, research on this material in the literature which says that um, the stress strain relationship is has a certain modulus. Um, but no, I haven't really thought about that measuring the force. Um, but that's a really good uh, question. My other question was, um, do the air bubbles that you talked about, uh -huh. do they ultimately kind of play a role when it ultimately does break? I mean, do they kind of get together when it, at some point it must fracture, right? I don't know if you yeah. pulled many beyond that point, but do you see something happening with these bubbles when it fractures? So actually, surprisingly, the bubbles don't have too much of an effect. Uh -huh. um, so when we're stretching the gel, we're indenting it with a cylinder and uh, the air bubbles are actually dispersed pretty far away from each other in the gel. And so when we get to about a five centimeter stretch, the region that we're stretching is actually pretty small and there's no more air bubbles in that region. All the air bubbles have migrated to the sides and are further up on the gel. Mm -hmm. And so the fracture actually occurs um, due to stretching of the gel and not due to, air, due to the air bubbles. But I suppose if we were unlucky and we did have a lot of air bubbles in the center of the gel where we're stretching it, then it might play a greater role in decreasing the fracture strain. But yeah, that's a really good question. Um, one of the nice things about these gels, again, is that they're really notch resistant um, because they have both ionic bonds and the covalent bonds. When you have a crack form in the gel, all the energy is dissipated by the ionic bonds but you still have the retention of the covalent network, which kind of allows the strain to be distributed over a greater area than if you just had one or the other. So the air bubbles play a smaller role than you'd expect. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I'm checking to see if anyone else has a question because I actually had one. Well, first of all, by the way, you're stretching it everywhere, really, aren't you? Except where it's clamped. Not True. Just, okay. But uh, my question, and I think you addressed it. I just want to make sure I understood it. You said the material's elastic, and I think you showed at least one figure where it returns to its original size when you release the stretching. Is that yes. correct? It doesn't. Do uh, you have any idea how many times you could stretch it, or is it indefinite before? I think. I think probably three or four times um, before the hysteresis really starts playing a role. Mm -hmm. um, at least that's what I've observed. Another thing I've observed is that you hold it, if you hold it in the stretched position for longer then actually that, I guess it destroys the bonds when you hold it in that stretched position. So there is his hysteresis going on. Um, but if you just stretch it, unstretch it, then it'll go back to its original position. I, I, I guess only one follow-up question then. You said if you hold it there for long, what's long? Um, I guess I haven't tried tried doing that. Uh, I haven't like hours? tested a huge, but, but minutes, yeah. Just minutes. That's okay, that's all. Uh, any other questions? If not, then thank you, Andrew. Okay, thank you. Sure. And Sean, when you're ready, you can start sharing your screen. Okay, we can see it. Uh, you have to can everyone hear me? Okay, I can hear you. So when you're ready, go ahead. All right, cool. Uh, yeah, so uh, this year I've been working on imaging biomolecular diffusion in the ECM or the extracellular matrix and ECM relevant hydrogels. Uh, and this has also been in uh, Dr. Kissler's lab. Uh, so a lot of the motivation behind this project is, is largely based around uh, chemotherapeutics and cancer treatment. Um, and so as we know, with chemotherapeutics, a lot of the time, uh, the side effects can be quite severe. 
and we don't really want, uh, if avoidable, and if it's early enough, and uh, when when the cancer can be localized, we wouldn't. We'd like to avoid circulating the chemotherapeutics throughout the entire body. Um, but actually, uh, in addition to the challenge of localizing cancer, the challenge of delivering chemotherapeutics locally is 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 quite difficult. Um, and with targeted drug delivery, the main the main barrier is this ECM or this extracellular matrix, because once the drug actually reaches the target cell, uh, we know that it'll work to do what it's designed to do. Um, but reaching reaching the cells, especially in a region with a lot of tumors, is is a non-trivial issue. Um, and so, in order to ensure, I guess, that the drug is actually reaching the cell, there are kind of two properties that we're interested in. The first is the diffusion dynamics of those drugs. Uh, so, how quickly are they diffusing? Are they getting stuck anywhere? Uh, are they interacting with the ECM in any way? And then we'd also like to see the nanoscale structure of that matrix or of the porous space in between the, spell, uh, between the cells. The reason being that um, with, with both of these combined, we can identify specific structures that might interact with or trap the drugs uh, and prevent them from reaching their target cells. Um, so there are two main classes of techniques that we, we look at. Uh, the first being fluorescence. Um, fluorescence is very popular in bioimaging because it doesn't interact super heavily uh, with the sample like uh, an electron beam might. Uh, and on top of that, uh, fluorescent imaging is just easy since, since fluorophores are, are pretty well understood and easy to uh, affix to different samples. So techniques like fluorescence correlation spectroscopy and fluorescence recovery after photo, photo bleaching uh, are both very good at capturing diffusion dynamics at biologically relevant diffusion rates. Um, the biggest problem is the wavelength of light is, I mean, for, for our microscope, maybe 561 nanometers. Um, but the things we want to look at are on the order of maybe tens to hundreds of nanometers. Uh, and we can talk about that limit a little bit more. Uh, but basically, a resolution for conventional fluorescence microscopy is just insufficient. Um, the other option is these alternative techniques, uh, like electron microscopies uh, and atomic force microscopy. Uh, they're primarily for imaging static samples, but even in electron microscopy, uh, electron beams are quite easily deflected. Um, so a lot of the times you need to image in a vacuum, and that requires a lot of sample preparation. So whether it's with cryo-EM when you need to actually freeze the sample or if you need to coat the sample in something, uh, it's very difficult to ensure that you're actually imaging the ECM in native conditions. Uh, and on top of that, with AFM, uh, it can distort the actual surface of the sample, but on top of that, it's very difficult to get any kind of uh, diffusion information or more than just surface information since since AFM really is just looking at the surface interaction. So given those two choices, the, the benefits of fluorescence microscopy tend to outweigh the cons. Um, again, it's very non-invasive. It doesn't interact super heavily with the sample, so we don't have to worry as much about uh, whether or not we're actually imaging the ECM natively and imaging diffusion without affecting it too much. Um, it is possible to get 3D information, although it's not something uh, we're looking at right now. And of course, uh, we really need to look at the dynamics. That's the key. And uh, fluorescence is quite good at that. The basic principle behind fluorescence is we use fluorescent labels, which essentially absorb energy from the laser and then re-emit a longer wavelength, which is then collected by the camera. And uh, in the long run, what we'd like to do is probably label drugs with uh, fluorescent tags um, that hopefully don't affect the diffusion too much. Uh, but for now, we just use regular fluorophores uh, just to, to test the principle. And we allow them to diffuse in these ECM-like gels. And then uh, they're obviously only able to diffuse in the pore space and not actually uh, like in the physical gel or in the physical matrix. And so we can actually map out in 2D uh, where there is void space and where there isn't void space, but again, with, with very limited resolution. And this resolution limit that I keep talking about is the diffraction limit. It's a fundamental limit on uh, the best resolution that we can get with our, our fluorescence microscopes. Um, and it's given as uh, the wavelength of light over two times the numerical aperture, which you can think of as just the range of angles over which your lens can collect light. So for a pretty generic bio and uh, like biomedical setup, you might expect around 250 nanometers. Um, and so what that means is if we have a fluorophore that's smaller than that, which is, is usually the case, that's emitting light that's collected by a lens, rather than seeing that fluorophore on the microscope, we actually get this Gaussian with airy disks. So if it's just a small number of fluorophores that aren't moving too much, it is quite easy to localize uh, since it, it is symmetric radially. So we know that it, it is somewhere in the middle. But the problem is if there are two fluorophores that are too close together, we can't distinguish them. And of course, nature is that not that nice. We don't know if it's, we don't necessarily know that it's either going to be one or two. It could be three, four or five. Uh, there's really not a good way to distinguish that. Uh, and so this is where our super resolution technique comes in. So similarly, similarly to uh, Sam's presentation, our, we first have, we take a movie that's separated into an image stack, which is just each frame uh, at each individual time step of these fluorophores diffusing around. And then at each individual pixel, we're going to extract an intensity and then autocorrelate over time. And so what that does for us is if there is a specific fluorophore that remains more or less stationary, that means the intensity will be pretty 
high the entire time, and then it'll have strong autocorrelation. So we know that there's likely a uh, pore space there where fluorophores can diffuse. But if we're in a space in between two fluorophores, then the signal is going to be quite scattered. Uh, it won't have strong correlation because it's coming from two separate fluorophores. Um, and on top of that, our technique is quite sensitive because if we have uh, some noise, um, like an intensity spike somewhere here that might be caused by shot noise or whatever it might be, because we're performing autocorrelation, it's not going to be constant intensity. It's likely going to drop off right after that. So uh, those points can actually get cut out. Um, and so based on these peak intensities from the auto or uh, peak correlation from the from the autocorrelation curves, we can make this uh, figure D. It's this auto or it's the super resolution map. Uh, and so basically, this is directly from this this uh, simulation here. So we can actually see the spaces where fluorophores can diffuse, and these black spaces are where there's actually pore, where there's not any uh, any any fluorescence. Um, and then at each individual pixel, we can also extract diffusion dynamics. Uh, these are known diffusion co uh, known diffusion models. Um, that can tell us two things, which are the anomaly, which is the uh, non-linearity of the mean squared displacement. So for, with Brownian diffusion, we expect a linear relationship between uh, MSD and time. Uh, when we have an alpha that's not one, that's just not the case. And then we also have the diffusion rate, which is simply how fast uh, a given fluorophore is diffusing. We can also see that these, these left panes of these two sets are the non-super resolved version. Uh, and the super resolution actually does, does something quite remarkable, which is that with conventional light microscopy, we can't even distinguish these two pores. Um, but by actually using this correlation, we're able to tell that there's actually a matrix here and that no fluorophores are able to diffuse there. And the resolution improvement is, is quite high. So I guess the two main halves of the, of the project that I've been working on are simulation and experiment. Uh, and it, it is pretty instructive to start with simulations since uh, they can tell us quite a few things. So this is a, an example of simulated data, similar to what we saw on the last slide. Um, it's just fluorophores moving around at a specific diffusion rate. Um, and uh, here's an example of experimental data. Uh, it got downsampled quite a bit and it looks very grainy, uh, but you'll just have to take my word for it. It, it is fairly similar to the simulated data. Uh, and, and this can tell us a lot of things. Um, with simulations, it's very easy to change the diffusion rate. Uh, you know, it's just changing one input rather than finding a range of fluorophores that all diffuse at uh, incrementally faster diffusion rates. Uh, and the same goes for fluorophore density rather than working with maybe 100 aliquots with different concentrations of some, some set solution. We can just change one number, how many fluorophores there are. Um, and on top of that, we can also push the signal noise ratio. So FCSOFI is quite a sensitive technique. We can image uh, signal noise ratios below two, which is quite uncommon for these super resolution techniques or single particle techniques. Um, but all of this information combined lets us choose, choose probes for when we actually move on to the experiment. Uh, so as far as the, the simulations go in a little bit more detail, we start with an SEM image from a different paper uh, from another group of polyacrylamide, which is a pretty similar gel to SEM, uh, or to, sorry, to, um, to the extracellular matrix. And it was taken with SEM. Um, and this is a good example of why SEM may not be the, the strongest technique for our specific application, because this entire paper basically shows a picture of a gel and then the rest of the paper is justifying why this gel is is you know actually actually how we're imaging the gel and in, in its native state not somehow altering it and then imaging that um, and so we've taken it we binarized it so basically the fluorophores are diffusing around in the white space but we also applied morphological functions because we can see here that the ecm is, is locally it's, it's quite heterogeneous uh, there are very small pores that are probably one to ten of nanometers and there are a lot larger pores which are microns across uh, but on top of that, it's also globally heterogeneous. So the ECM is, is around all of our cells. So there's extracellular space in our, in our brains, in our hands, wherever. Uh, and you might imagine that in a cancerous region, it might be a lot more crowded, a lot more, uh, you know, higher concentration of gel as the, uh, or of ECM as, as each of the cells excretes more, uh, more protein. Uh, and so the first row here, this is the results, uh, is the ground truth. This is basically those three figures from the previous slide. Uh, colored in at the diffusion rate that we simulated, which is one times 10 to the fifth. It's a little bit slow for, for biological diffusion, but it, it's still certainly relevant. Uh, and and this, is, this is simply what we might expect. Um, and this is the extracted FCS SOFI image. So we, we ran the simulations and analyzed it with our super resolution code, and it looked something like this. Um, so notably, there are, some, there are some differences. So this red arrow here points to these, uh, you can see these dark blue features. Um, and this is subdiffusive, so it's very slow diffusion. And this is basically, you see them in, in pores that are very small and also narrow channels where the beads might have gotten stuck. Uh, and this, this is useful. This can tell us that, hey, drugs might be prone to getting, getting stuck in these kinds of regions. And on top of that, we also see uh, with this blue arrow, this like darker purple, also a lot less subdiffusive effects um, around the borders. 
Uh, and this is likely a little bit due to how the simulation was written. Um, but in practice, this can also uh, experimentally show us that maybe the gel is interacting with the, the diffusing drugs in some way, whether it's electrochemically or, or uh, electrostatically. Um, and so with the alpha map, which is the anomaly, again, the nonlinearity of the MSD, we see something quite similar. Although notably, we don't see uh, the super subdiffusive behavior in the, in the narrow pores, we do see this, this edge behavior again. Um, and just to verify that our super resolution is actually working, uh, because visually you can, you can look and say that, yeah, they look, they look roughly similar. We like to back that up with a little bit of statistics. Uh, and we can see that um, between the ground truth and the FCS SOFI images that were extracted, we have uh, very good agreement uh, between the pore size distributions. With the exception of this third column, which uh, at the moment I think our, our our super resolution is our resolution is not necessarily as high as, as it might be in the future, um, but but again that's something that we're working on. So the difference between five pores and two pores is is in practice not not huge, but when there are that few pores, it's it's very evident here. Uh, and another thing to notice is that there are actually some pores that are just missing from the ground truth versus the FCS SOFI image, which might seem problematic, but it's also I think a, a quite physical because in an experiment if you're having your drugs diffused through this, this very dense matrix and there are pores that are completely blocked off. There's no way we would ever get any signal from them because the drugs wouldn't be able to make it inside. Uh, so it's actually not much of an issue. Um, and so moving on to experiment, uh, this, is, this is our basic experimental setup. So these are just cover slips with a little silicone well inside. Uh, and then inside that well, we just have the, whatever gel we're using with, in this case, we used agarose at 1.5% with uh, 155 kilodalton dextran diffusing inside. Uh, the reason we chose 155 kilodalton dextran is because one, it's very big, um, and it's also uh, as far as molecular weights goes, uh, so it diffuses a little bit more slowly than than a much smaller protein might uh, compared to this polymer. And then it's also fluorescently labeled every hundred glucan groups, which means it's very very bright. Um, and this is basically just to ensure that with the first uh, you know foray into experiment that we're actually seeing the dextran diffuse and not dirt or something else. Um, so while this, this is certainly not super realistic as a drug, um, it, it's good just to verify that what we're seeing is actually what we're think, or what we think we're seeing is actually a, a what we want to be seeing. Um, and so we imaged it with this TERF microscope. Uh, TERF stands for Total Internal Reflection Fluorescence Microscopy. Um, and it's, it's similar to wide field, but uh, it actually totally internally reflects off this bottom cover slip. And what that does for us is it gives us an evanescent wave that only penetrates about 100 nanometers into the sample rather than like where epifluorescence might go all the way through. Uh, and since our technique right now is, is 2D, this basically ensures that we're cutting all this background fluorescence and not exciting any fluorophores that are beyond that 100 nanometers. Uh, and that can increase our signal noise ratio and also um, save us a lot of, a lot of heartache. Uh, and again, so basically the goal here is to, to identify, uh, this is still from simulation, but an example, uh, to identify certain structures that might uh, cause subdiffusive behavior, cause particles to get trapped. Um, and so these are, these are very, very preliminary results, but uh, exciting nonetheless. Um, so we have a control here, which is just the dextran diffusing around in a buffer. Um, and we see that it diffuses at around two times 10 to the eighth nanometer squared per second, which is uh, quite fast, but also very biologically relevant. Uh, and we also see that there's not much uh, patterning or anything. Um, and it's also more or less diffusing at the same rate throughout the sample, as we can see from this pretty small standard deviation. Uh, which is what we expect to see. It's just dextran freely diffusing. Uh, but then when we introduce the dextran into an agarose gel, we actually see uh, some, some large features here, which are likely just gel that's blocking uh, the diffusion of dextran. And we also see a lot of random pockets of subdiffusion. Now, this is also super early and we haven't taken uh, nearly enough data to make any uh, strong conclusions, but uh, it does appear that in some way the agarose gel is inhibiting the diffusion of this dextran. Uh, and it's, it'd be interesting to know how. And we can also see that there's uh, quite a large range of, of diffusion coefficients, and also uh, the diffusion is, is slower when it's being inhibited by dextran or by the agarose. Um, so it's a sneak peek to future future events. Um, but regardless, uh, yeah, I'd like to thank uh, the entire group, but of course Will in particular, who um, was largely responsible for making the FCS Sophie code usable. Uh, Nam, who picked up the uh, picked up after Will graduated, and of course uh, Dr. Kisley, who facilitated the entire project. Um, yeah, uh, thanks for listening. And then I think we have time for questions. I'd be happy to take any of them. Yes, we do have time for questions. Are there any? Um, yeah, I, I have a question. Oh, um, I thought I, I thought it was really interesting. Um, if I understand you correct, like you correctly, like, I understand the, like, the experiment correctly, I guess. It's like looking at like how drug molecules interact with their environment, right? Mm, yeah, sure. 
<laughs> yeah, it's like so oversimplified. Yeah. Um, so I was wondering, like, were you interested in like looking at like how drug molecules like interacted with with each other, like aggregation and stuff like that? Perhaps? Yeah. So or aggregation is is something that that we considered, but ideally, that's that's. Uh, I mean, as far as using this technique goes, you definitely be able to identify it. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, we were trying to to avoid aggregation because right now we're focusing on trying to actually just image the matrix. Right. Um, right. That makes sense. Yeah. Aggregation, you also do not, you don't necessarily need to image the gel or the, the drugs diffusing in anything other than just like a buffer solution since you'd, you'd be able to identify that. So right, right. I don't think you'd need such a specialized technique to identify that uh, aggregation. But um, yeah, specifically interactions between the gel and the drugs are a lot harder to image with, with conventional techniques. And I think that's that where our, our technique shines. Yeah, that, yeah. Re uh, yeah, great. Thank you. Other questions? We're a little bit ahead of schedule. So, Sean, could you actually back up one slide? Sure. Yeah, I just more. wanted to say, I know this. What's that? So the slide? Any of them. Uh, that's fine. Any of them. Okay. Almost any of them. Sure. I just noticed in the upper right that you've dated it 2020. Yeah. And yeah. actually, you anticipated one of my questions on this slide. I was going to ask if you were using the code that Will wrote last year for his senior project. So, you... uh, I mean, yes, Will is here. Uh, so part of Will's project was making it into a more, uh, I guess, widely faster? usable code. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so the two facets were making it a lot faster and then making it accessible to people who might not be as code savvy. Uh, so the GUI, I don't use as frequently, but the, uh, the making it faster has definitely saved me a lot of time because calculations that would have taken an hour or two take like maybe 30 to 40 seconds. Uh, which is just makes research so much more <laughs> enjoyable. But, yeah. So it, thank it is you, very, Will. Yes, big, big thank you to Will for sure. Are there any other questions? Okay. Well, I see Professor Rosenblatt just joined us. I was pretty confident he would. We're, we're just a couple of minutes early, but with him and Skyler both here, uh, we can go ahead and get started, uh, Skyler, when you're ready. Yeah, sure. Um, we can hear you. Very cool. We'd love to hear it. Okay. Um, okay. And we can see your screen share. So when you're ready, go ahead. Snazzy, snazzy, snazzy. Okay, I'm going to just minimize you guys out of the way. Okay, very cool. All right, hello everyone. My name is Skylar Denhoff, um, and today I'm going to be presenting on my work characterizing the pre tilt of the surface alignment layer. SC1211, so it can be used uh, to pattern, um, it, to create patterns to create liquid crystal skirmions. So I've been uh, working with Dr. Rosenblatt throughout the year um, with the crew physics department. Um, and this project is funded by the NSF. Okay, sweet. So um, there's a lot of material I wanna cover. So just as a brief overview, uh, first I'll talk about um, sort of our motivations and what the actual objectives of this project are. Um, and then I want to talk a bit about um, the materials that I'm using and give some context to um, what kinds of research has been done uh, before us, um, both in the realm of uh, skirmions and then also the material characterization that we're working on. Um, and then from there, I'll get into our methods, uh, some of the results throughout the year, and then our conclusions and some further studies that um, can continue after this project. So if you're not familiar, skirmions are, are these... Uh, untangleable vortex-like knots that occur in a variety of vector field media. So that includes uh, quantum Hall systems, Bose-Einstein condensates, helical ferromagnets, and liquid crystals. Um, so this figure here, uh, it actually comes from reference six. I forgot to change the number there. Um, it's an example of what's called an N equals one half skirmion. Um, so you can see how at the outer edge here, we go from, we'll call this uh, 90 degrees uh, to about zero degrees in the middle. So that makes it a one half uh, skirmion. Okay, so uh, they were first noticed in high energy physics by Tony Skirm in the 1960s, um, and their utility has since been best recognized in magnetic systems and spintronics. So in many of these vector fields, studying skirmions often requires pretty difficult experimental conditions. Liquid crystals, on the other hand, don't require these kinds of extreme uh, experimental conditions, so they're pretty ideal for studying skirmions. And the idea here is to take advantage of the liquid crystal's natural tendency to conform to a patterned alignment layer. So in the long term, what we wanna do is describe patterns in such an alignment layer 
to create a lattice of liquid crystal spermions in specific sizes and locations. Um, and then from that, where we would hopefully be able to study the, like the energetics and the frustration and the lattice periodicity of, of such a network. Um, and then those kinds of experimental findings could uh, be mapped over to skirmions in, in other uh, vector fields that uh, arguably have more utility than liquid crystal skirmions. So like I said, long-term goals are to uh, AFM scribe skirmion patterns, or um, patterns in the SE1211 to create skirmions um, in liquid crystals. Um, but before we can do any of that, what we really need to do is um, understand the degree of control we have over our alignment layer. Um, so we need to be able to, to very carefully finesse the polar and azimuthal orientation of our alignment layer molecules. That is our current objective. And that's pretty much what I'm gonna be presenting on from here on out. Um, so the alignment layer that we're studying is uh, primarily called, the it's the polyamid SE1211. So SE1211 has this polyamid backbone that lays uh, flat against the surface it's applied to. And then it has these alkyl side chains that stick up uh, vertically or homeotropically. And we call that uh, zero degrees. Um, so if we over bake the SE1211, both in, in times and temperatures, um, we can then apply a force to, to the molecules that can sort of bend these alkyl side chains into a non-zero pre-tilt. And that's how we're gonna be able, hopefully to, to make our patterns in the surface alignment um, and then make, make liquid crystal skirmions. So in terms of other materials, we also are looking at mixing RN1175, which is a planar polyamide um, alignment layer with the SE1211. And what adding a planar alignment layer does is it'll help increase the range of pre-tilt control we have with our SE1211. And then in terms of the liquid crystal that we're using, it's called 5CB. Um, and just as a few properties of 5CB, it has a positive anisotropy, it's non-chiral, and it forms a room temperature pneumatic. Um, all right, so just as a brief, like adding context to uh, liquid crystal skirmions throughout history. So skirmions in liquid crystals have been observed and studied by other groups um, and in, in somewhat similar ways to what we are hoping to explore um, with our own work. Um, most notably, I'd like to point out that in 2016, Ravnik uh, observed skirmion-like structures on, on chemically patterned alignment surfaces. Um, so chemically, not mechanically patterned surfaces. And then in 2018, um, Zoomer theorized the generation of, of skirmions uh, via actual surface patterning techniques that are mechanically induced. Um, so the experimental niche that we're sort of fitting in here is um, experimentally uh, making these mechanically patterned alignment layers. Um, and that's kind of where we fit into all of this. And then as for the actual SE1211 material, the SE1211 pre-tilt control has actually been studied pretty extensively by the liquid crystals and complex fluid group here at CASE. Um, so like in 2001, the group voted, first noticed that um, over baking and rubbing SE1211 induces a, a zero to 40 degree pre-tilt range in 5CB. Um, and then in 2005, uh, they were able to observe pretty much the same range of pre-tilts by using AFM scribing to do the mechanical uh, applied force there. Um, and then also in 2005, the group explored pre-tilts um, in, in other um, liquid crystals, uh, including 6CB, 7CB, and 8CB. So um, this whole uh, series of liquid crystals are, are essentially the same basic structure, just um, essentially uh, as you increase the number um, you're increasing the length of the molecule. Um, and so from this study, uh, the group found that 5CB required the weakest rubbing to get that range of pre-tilts. And that's sort of motivating why we're using 5CB now. Um, and then in 2007, the group observed that by adding RN1175 to the SC1211, we, uh, they weren't indeed able to measure a much greater range in pre-tilts extending all the way from zero to 90 degrees, um, which is why we've been looking at using RN 1175 in our current work. And then another study in 2008 um, was focusing on different uh, liquid crystal properties, but it's another study that demonstrates the uh, full range of pre-tilt control that the group had in SE 1211 at the time. Um, so this just gives you some, some context and background here that um, this has been done before. Now the, the, the issue here, and maybe you can see from the timeline, is that this was done over a decade ago. Um, 
and we're still using the same material from from over a decade ago. So it's really necessary at this point that we're recharacterizing RSC 1211 and making sure that it's still viable for this application. So then in, in terms of methods, I've been following basically the same procedures that were outlined in, in these papers here. Um, so it's been a really helpful roadmap. So uh, the, the basic process is first we cut and clean two glass slides. In general, one glass slide is spin coated with SE1211 that's baked in an oven according to the manufacturer specifications for homeotropic alignment. The other slide is um, co spin coated with the SE1211 and RN1175 uh, mixture. Then it's overbaked and then gradiently rubbed. Um, and we do this gradient rubbing using this rolling spinning cloth. Um, and we have the cell propped there, the, the glass slide propped at an angle. And as this, um, this translation uh, stage goes underneath the rolling cloth, we can apply a gradient strength of mechanical rubbing across the cell. Um, after we've done the rubbing on the overbake slide, we epoxy the slides together and they're separated by three micron mylar spacers. And then we heat up 5CB to its isotropic phase and insert it into the gap using capillary action. So this is kind of a, a, a cross-sectional diagram of what a completed cell might look like where we have our SE1211, RN1175 mixture that's been overbaked and gradiently rubbed on the bottom. And then we have our homeotropic SE1211 on the top with our liquid crystal inserted between. And so you can kind of see here how the liquid crystal in this um, very generous diagram um, uh, conforms to our alignment layers on both sides here. So in terms of methods, um, we can qualitatively observe if there's successful pre-tilt behavior by looking at the cell under cross polarizers. So here's just a very basic diagram of um, a sample between cross polarizers being illuminated from below. And then this video I really like because it's a nice demonstration of the power and utility of viewing these rub cells under cross polarizers. So initially the sample rubbing direction is parallel with one of the polarizers, which is why we can't see any Oh, here we go, which is why we can't see any light um, going through the sample. But when we wrote, sorry, when we rotate the cell um, 45 degrees uh, relative to each polarizer, that's when we can fully see the interaction of the crystals with the light that's coming through the polarizers. Um, so this is a pretty powerful technique um, that we use throughout the entire experimental process, whether it be qualitative or quantitative. Um, anytime we're looking at these samples, the rubbing direction is 45 degrees relative to our polarizers. So that's just some context there. And then in terms of things that we can look at qualitatively, if a sample appears dark like this, it's likely behaving homeotropically and we can further verify this just by tapping on the sample. When you do that, you'll see like flashes of, of light and dark. And if this weren't magnified so much right here, um, you zoomed out, you'd see it in what's called a Maltese cross pattern. Uh, so this is homeotropic behavior, just dark no pre-tilt. And then if we're starting to see actual color come through, that does correspond with a tilt behavior in our alignment layer. Um, so that's it's getting towards the right direction. Um, but what we really want to see is a gradient in colors. And that gradient in colors corresponds to a gradient in pre-tilts. So qualitatively, that's what we're hoping to observe if um, this SE1211 is working the way that we want it to. Now, quantitatively, we can measure the actual pre-tilt um, using an optical setup with uh, cross polarizers again, and using what's called a Babinet Soli compensator. We can use this compensator to minimize the signal that gets through to this photo detector. And by doing that, we're measuring what's called the optical retardation at various points along the cell. Now, optical retardation, as we can see from this equation here, is a function of our pre-tilt, which we're solving for. Um, so once we've measured the optical retardation, we set it equal to this equation, and then we can use numerical root finding to solve for our pre-tilt. Um, just a kind of important note about this equation. Um, it is an approximation. Here we're assuming that the um, bend in elastics, uh, the bend and splay coefficients of the liquid crystal are equal to each other. That's called the elastic constants approximation. Um, and then also it's important here to note that we're integrating over the local cell thickness. Um, so wherever we're measuring the optical retardation, we need to know the thickness of the cell at that point. Um, and we measure those thicknesses using interferometry techniques. Okay, so now I wanna take you on a brief um, journey throughout the semester. Um, and it's just fun to look at liquid crystals. So hopefully these will be kind of interesting for you all. Um, and yeah, I just wanna take you on a brief journey and, and go through some of the kind of interesting inconsistencies we've been encountering with this material. So first um, we started just by overbaking 
our SC1211, just the SC1211. We're not adding R1175 yet, just SC1211. We started by overbaking it at um, about 230 degrees Celsius for about 90 minutes. And we saw some encouraging results at this point. So if we look at this rubbed sample here, we can see that um, there is actually kind of the gradient behavior that, that is uh, encouraging for what we're trying to observe as we go from those blues to purples to pinks to kind of an orange salmon to, to almost yellow at the end there. However, there are a few problems with this observation. Um, all this intermittent uh, darkness is not ideal. Um, uh, and then if we're looking at another sample that was uh, constructed in the same way, here you can see a gradient, but this gradient is in the opposite direction of the rubbing direction, which is no good. We want the gradient to be in the direction of the rubbing direction. Um, so this is another inconsistency here. And then if we just look at the sample without rubbing the overbaked SE1211, um, what we see over here is, uh, oh, my bad. Sorry, I'm losing my mouse here. Okay, what we see here is without even rubbing, we're getting a lot of color shining through and even, even hints at this gradient behavior that we are seeing with the rubbing. Um, and, and this is also not ideal. What we'd wanna be seeing without rubbing is just homeotropic behavior. So what this set of um, samples here demonstrates is that at these temperatures and times, we're, we're baking either too hot or for too long. So um, this encouraged us to try um, baking at the same temperature, but for, for less time. Um, so here's a series of samples that you can see we've been baking um, from about 60 to 90 minutes. Um, but again, we're not, we're not really seeing a consistent trend as we're increasing the time. Um, and what, what is encouraging is that now we are seeing a transition from homeotropic uh, to non-homeotropic behavior, but we're not seeing that smooth color gradient that we've been looking for. Um, so on, on to the next idea, we try lowering the temperature. And again, looking at a, at a variety of times um, and kind of the same thing, we're not really, uh, not the same thing in terms of what we saw on the previous slide, but in terms of lack of trends, I guess we could say. Um, the, maybe maybe we're seeing some homeotropic behavior with, with smatterings of some sort of pre-tilt in between. Um, but really it's not until we get to the sample F over here where we kind of see what's closer to what we've been hoping to see this entire time, um, where we go from, from this homeotropic uh, to a transition to these, these bands of colors. So this was an encouraging cell to see. And so from there, I wanted to kind of coax that effect out of, of this particular um, uh, assembly process. So preparing the sample in essentially the same way, we wanted to see if we can draw that gradient out. Um, and one way of doing that would be to increase the, the rubbing strength and where that rubbing strength begins along the cell. Um, and so each of these, these images here is, is a, a different slide that's been rubbed at a different strength. Um, and you can see that as we're increasing the strength, we're not really getting the effects we want to see, which is kind of curious and yeah, motivates us on to our next decision. Um, and then in these first two slides, we, you may think, oh, this is, this is kind of promising, very cool. And it is pretty. Um, however, uh, this is just a very small region near the very edge of the cell. Um, so it's, it's not quite uh, useful for, for what we're trying to achieve here. So from, from here, our investigations of just SC1211 was, weren't really uh, getting anywhere. So at this point, we uh, started adding RN1175 to our um, SC1211. And, and this is when things get really interesting. Um, so uh, we also increased our baking temperature pretty high and decreased the baking time to about 50 minutes. So at 270 degrees, for instance, you see a lot of color coming through, a lot of color. And then as we go down the slide, increasing rubbing strength, we see this, this kind of cool transition from like this neon yellowish green to more oranges and pinks. Um, so that's kind of exciting. And then this other image over here, we see baked at 280 degrees Celsius. Um, it's, it's a lot more homeotropic with like some transition into what looks like to be kind of a low angle pre-tilt. So I, I, from these two images here, we're looking kind of for this Goldilocks temperature right in between. And sure enough, at 275 degrees, here we are, look at that. We got homeotropic uh, behavior on the left side here where we had low, like uh, light rubbing. And then as we move along the cell and the rubbing strength increases, we get, we get this gradient of color. So this was, this was really exciting. Look, look at that, very cool, very pretty. Um, very, very fun to look at in my humble opinion. Um, and so 
I was able to look at this boxed region um, in the sample here and start to measure the actual optical retardation, like I was describing before with our qualitative methods. Um, and measuring the optical retardation, which is again, delta alpha here on the x-axis, I was able to um, solve for a range in, in pre-tilts that actually go pretty significantly wide range from about 15 degrees to 75. Um, so that was really exciting and promising to see. Um, and if the sample were consistently reproducible, this would be a really good place to start um, working with like atomic force microscopy to start using the stylus um, to create these mechanical effects in the rubbing. However, uh, as exciting as this was, uh, attempts to reproduce this sample in, have, have been interestingly unsuccessful. Um, so here, here are a couple of examples of some attempts at recreating uh, to the best of my ability, the exact conditions under which I produced that previous result. Um, and you can see the first three attempts not really um, getting anything. We, we get a, a little bit of striation from the rubbing cloth, um, these lines here, um, but really it's dominantly homeotropic. And even as we increase the rubbing strength over here, mm, still mostly homeotropic. And so these next few slides are kind of just a, a general demonstration of like a variety of different, different things we can explore, like increasing the ratio of RN1175 to SE1211 while varying temperature, um, increasing the ratio even more. Uh, at this point, we tried using different stock material that we had in hand, still old material from about a decade ago, but different material. Um, still not really uh, giving us much of a color gradient at all. Um, part, part of this problem may be that we weren't uh, rubbing these samples hard enough. So that's what I've been most recently looking into is increasing that rubbing strength. but even still so far um, that increasing the rubbing hasn't been particularly helpful, but I will have more information within a week, which is kind of exciting. Um, so that's kind of where we're at now, uh, just as a, as a summary here. What we've been trying to do is uh, characterize the mixture of SC1211 and RN1175 um, and, and get a nice range of pre-tilt control. And one sample has been able to exhibit a, a range in pre-tilts from about 15 to 75 degrees, which is pretty nifty. Um, even though recreations have been dominantly homeotropic. Um, now this could be because our SE1211 supply might just be too old. It may not be viable for this application anymore. That's a distinct possibility. Um, but there are a lot of things that we can still continue exploring with what we have. We can keep adjusting the ratios of uh, SE1211 to RN1175 we can keep adjusting our baking times and temperatures like we have been throughout the year. We can keep trying different planar alignment layers. We can replace the RN1175 with um, another material called PI2555, for instance. It's supposed to be PI, not P1. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, we can continue increasing the rubbing strength as well um, to see if we get any effects. And hopefully with experimental persistence, if we can create this consistent gradient rubbing um, in SC1211, we can start to actually make patterns to uh, make liquid crystal skirmions, which would be pretty cool. Uh, so I just want to acknowledge again that this project is funded by the NSF award DMR 190179. Um, and I'd like to thank Dr. Rosenblatt for his uh, guidance and encouragement and patience throughout the year um, to keep this project going along. It's been, it has been quite a great experience. Um, and then Adam Susser, who's another graduate student in the lab, um, his insight um, and um, expertise in the lab has been really helpful uh, getting things done. And then Andrew, Fer Dr. Andrew Ferris is a former graduate student who helped get this project off the ground in the fall. Um, and then there's a lot of references here, which is just mostly from literature in the very beginning, if you're curious. Um, and I'd love to take questions if you have any. Uh, thank you for listening. So questions. Lydia, go ahead. <laughs> Some experimental research fund stylus <laughs> new talk but uh, very persistent like you said persistent experimental work so i have a question on slide 11. yeah um, if you can go back there with your uh, optical setup yeah yeah sorry one moment ah cool yeah so can you explain to me what the compensator does i'm not familiar with that component no, of course. Okay, so um, uh, maybe providing a bit too much background here, but uh, the liquid crystal that we have and, and crystals in general have um, uh, two axes, right? The ordinary axis and the extraordinary axis. Um, and so as light hits the crystal, um, it's gonna mm, 
propagate in both directions. And I, might, I may be butchering this explanation slightly, um, but essentially what's going on here um, when we're measuring the retardation, it's the difference in the light propagation along those two axes. So what this compensator does is it compensates um, for the difference in that light propagation. Um, and that's by adjusting the compensator, um, we can um, null out that difference. And then um, the light that's passing through the cross polarizers, it's as if the sample is aligned with the cross polarizers. So it, it minimizes the signal. That's a bit of a scattered explanation. Um, did that help? Yes, that helps. Okay, thank you. Uh, Just one other quick. Himself, I see, so he may have something to add. <clears throat> okay, then just one quick other question. You put like you're, you're using 5x magnification for all these images, but how big of an area are those images showing? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, hmm. Off the top of my head, I haven't put too much thought into it because it's something I take for granted. Um, like is it millimeters, microns, nanometers? Like how big are these images showing you? So this is at five times magnification of this region here. Um, so we're looking at about, uh, oh, but this is like a really long composite signal. Um, uh, I would, I guess based off of the scale, I would go with micron. Thank you. Thanks. Other John, questions? Yeah. Um, so nice talk, Skylar. Um, so, but as I can, can you speak up, Walter? Sorry. Can you speak louder? Yes. Um, so basically, the colors you're seeing now, which are beautiful, <laughs> are basically following these patterns that you make. I mean, or the the rubbing that you make. Now, how would you recognize? It? But they're not really a sign of the spermians yet, right? Oh no, we're very far away from the skirmion okay. stage. So how would you recognize what would the skirmion look like if there is one there? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, oh, to be honest with you, I haven't thought that far ahead because I've been so wrapped up in like the immediate task. Um, but if I had to guess, um, and this is a generous guess, um, the way that I would envision it is looking under a microscope. We we would see a. a twist in color but like concentrically almost and the other thing that's kind of important to note here is like there are a couple different configurations you could explore with these uh skirmion patterns you could go in like a spiral you could go in concentric circles um you could you could have a range of of tilts if you were that masterful over the material um but i would visualize it personally and this might be wrong as um colors kind of going inward i see i don't know what on what scale would it be would that be a Oh, on the scale, we'd be working on the on nanometer to uh, micrometer range. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? How come nobody has asked Skylar how Skylar got into skirmions? <laughs> it wasn't originally her project, but someone else uh, dropped out, and I thought this would be a perfect match. Um, yeah, I, I think the problem in the end turned out to be that the material is just not doing what it did 10 years ago. As Gary, Walter, and I know very well, when you're older, things don't always work the way they did when you were younger. Notice I left Lydia out. Lydia's still young. Thanks, Chuck. Just wondering, is it, is that chemical not easy to purchase or is it really expensive or something? Um, it, I, I used to have a uh, patron at Nissan Chemical Industries, which made this, and he would send me samples. Now they only sell it in sort of like 55 gallon drums. Okay. And it's, you know, probably in the neighborhood of $100,000 and they won't send, he's no longer at the company, so uh -huh. they no longer send samples out. So they can't just send you some milliliters? I've asked and, yeah. you know. <laughs> Um, they won't do that anymore. So, hence, we're trying to keep alive our old sample, and it doesn't seem to be working the way we had hoped. Okay, well, in any case, we should move on to Ricky Pengbo. But first, I want to thank Skylar on behalf of everyone. And so, uh, 
Thank you. Whenever you're ready, you can share your screen. Yeah. Let's see. And we can hear you. And we can see your screen. So go ahead. Used to be able to hear you. Okay. Okay, I see you're unmuted. I can't hear you. Can anyone else? Nope. I think he must be uh, is locked to trying to log back in. Yep, here he comes back. Oh, okay. Okay, I can hear you now again. Okay, sorry about that. Here we can Hopefully see your screen. It works. It's working. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Perfect. Hmm. Well, uh, hello. Am I cut out again? You're fine, go ahead. Okay. Okay, so um, my name is Ricky. And before I start, I just, I just like to say thank you to those of you who came in today and, and other people who have stayed here since this morning. Thank you so much for staying. I'm working with Dr. Rosenblatt on really tearing stability in two layer fluid systems and interface material transport. So first order of business, I'd like to lay some background information on my project. My project specifically investigates what is called the Rayleigh Taylor instability, aka RT instability. It broadly describes um, an interfacial phenomenon that happens whenever you have two fluids of different densities mixing together. It might help to visualize water on top mixing with oil below under gravity, but more generally, it's the the the, the instability phenomenon incorporates all such mixing scenarios. This phenomenon is observed frequently and extensively in nature and our understanding of this, of this instability powers applications in many, many areas of physics and engineering, for example, in inertial confinement fusion. The success of the ignition process in a typical laser driven in a typical laser driven implosion experiment is largely dependent on how well we can estimate the growth rate of the instability of the ablation front. We need to be able to limit it to a very narrow window so that we can ensure success. And then another example comes from the field of astrophysics. It is long believed that, what is it? It is long believed that the, the bubble and the bubble and spike morphology, like the finger-like structure, filamentary structure that we observe in the Crab Nebula nowadays can be accounted for by the by what, what is called the magnetic RT instability. So essentially what this what this is is as the central like high density um, nebular matter pushes out into the surrounding space, surrounding like lower density space and and pushes into the thermal ejecta, the thermal ejecta will fall into the core and this is, is this this is conditioned for an RT instability, and what we observe today, the the filamentary structure today, is actually and believed to be an ongoing evolution of RT instability that spans thousands of years in the universe. So that's all nice and easy, and um, the as for the theoretical background of it. It can be all all RT instabilities can be explained by one might say the holy grail of hydrodynamics, what is called the Navier-Stokes equations. And those of you who might have looked into this, the this the smoothness. I'm sorry, the existence, the uniqueness, and the smoothness of solutions to Navier-Stokes equations are actually one of the Millennium problems. 
And so it is still at the forefront, even nowadays it is still at the forefront of theoretical investigation. But thankfully, we don't need to get, to get into much gory detail of that. We're only interested in the beginning stages of such instability for our purposes. That being said, we can roughly categorize the growth of such instability into three categories. The first is the linear growth regime that we're interested in. This basically means the growth rate is constant. And so we, I think it's easier for us to quantify and investigate. And after that, you have your um, secondary instability of spikes. And then anything after that is, one might say, the chaotic behavior, the self-similar growth regime. So in the linear growth regime, for example, if we have a sinusoidal initial deformation with uh, wave vector k. Its growth, its growth would look something like, um, like that equation, that, like what that equation says. And um, our, specific pro our specific goal is to um, investigate what, like how the growth rate sigma changes when we change um, wave vectors or changed um, densities of the two fluids and like basically various properties of the two fluids. This is, this is what, this is what is at interest here. And um, even though there has been many, there has been much work on explaining the arcane stability, the experimental verification of it had always kind of fallen behind exactly because of the difficulties one will definitely encounter in setting up the metastable interface in the first place. Because remember, you have, what is it? You have a lighter of high, heavier liquid floating on top of the lighter one. But this is not the case anymore. I believe maybe 10 to 20 years ago, the, at the beginning of this century, a group of scientists worked out a way to use magnetic levitation to magnetically levitate the heavier liquid on top of the, uh, the lighter one, and essentially employing what is called the in situ technique. That just basically means you, throughout the entire experiment, you don't need to move, you need to flip the cell, you need to move the cell, you don't need to do anything to, mechanically to the cell so that this is a great way to reduce any um, unwanted perturbation and greatly reduces systematic errors. So on this diagram on the right, um, you have two, on the sides, you have two Faraday pole pieces that supply a strong magnetic field that has a vertical gradient. And then through interacting with this external magnetic field, the, the upper mm, heavier liquid, which in our, which in our case we use um, um, manganese chloride tetrahydrate. Through interacting with this magnetic field, it feels a force that balances off its gravity. So, hence establishing this um, metastable interface. And, and then uh, for the lower liquid, we have almost magnetically inert hexadecane. And the heavy liquid has, I believe, an SG of approximately 1.4. And then the hexadecane has an SG, SG means specific gravity, has a specific gravity of about 0.8. And another plus to this setup is that we can also attach magnetically permeable short wires on the outer surface of the cell. These, these are passive magnetic components that serve to deform, locally deform the interface. So we can use, we can, we can use this kind of um, configuration to spatially modulate the interface and create arbitrary initial conditions as we want. So that was the setup of our experiment. The, our specific goal is to find out how the evolution of the perturbation, what the evolution of per perturbation looks like when say we have a thin uniform layer of micron sized particles at the interface. That just means what happens when we also introduce mass to the interface because before you only have a single interface between two layers, but now you also have mass to it. So we decided to use silicon dioxide particles of diameters of either three microns or five microns for our purposes. Um, these particles have an SG of one point, of between 1.8 to two, that's 
their um, nominal specific gravity. So technically they are heavier than both liquids. So naturally, you, if you inject them into the cell, they will fall, they, they will perhaps sink right to the bottom. And hopefully as they, as they cross the, as, as they're crossing the interface, they'll get caught there and anchor at the interface via surface tension. That is our hope. However, because these particles come in water-based colloids that have, I believe, 5% solid content by weight, then because of this dilution, the particles, um, the colloids have a specific gravity very close to that of water. So if you were to, if you were to just crudely inject that colloid into the mix, into the, I'm sorry, into the cell, they will float very quickly to the top of the cell, carrying the particles within them. And that is not something we want. And the reason why this happens is because the part, um, what is it, the colloid doesn't have enough time because it takes some time for the colloid to fully mix with its surrounding um, manganese chloride solution. And because if we, if we, were, to, if, if we were to directly inject that into the cell, does, wouldn't, wouldn't have enough time to do that. So how do we solve this problem? We essentially take the mixing stage outside the cell. What we do is we premix silicon dioxide colloid with a little bit of manganese chloride solution at a ratio of at most one point, um, sorry, one to two. A stage uh, we call the homogenization and you, you shake it real good. And then afterwards you inject the homogenized mixture with a winged infusion set colloquially known as a butterfly needle. And then you use, use this set to inject the homogenized mixture just a few millimeters above the interface. And then the rest of the work is left to, is left to gravity. Gravity will pull the particles down and then the particles will get caught at the interface. So um, after we have the data, the, we move on to the analysis. The analysis consists mainly of three parts. First and foremost, that's the most important part, I believe, is, the, um, is you have to correct for parallax. And the reason why there is a parallax is because, because, of, the, is because of the obstruction of the Faraday pole pieces on the sides. So you cannot like, directly observe what's going on in the cell. You have to use a mirror to reflect, this, to reflect the cell. And then that reflection is what the camera captures. The camera is situated at the very bottom of the whole setup. So um, the way we do this is we use um, an image processing algorithm in MATLAB. As you can see on the right here, on the top part is, is the um, distorted image of the, of the cell, of the, of the cell, yeah. And then um, what, this, what this algorithm, how the way this algorithm calculates this, the, this distortion is it identifies a geometrical transformation between the distorted, distorted image and the original image that you supply to the algorithm, uh, which is and the, on, the, on the bottom part, you can, tell, you can tell that the corrected, the corrected image does look like, um, like a square graph paper, the one that we supplied in the first place. And then after that, you use another MATLAB code, an, an edge detection code to locate the interface. And then you fit that interface to a model and the model given by that equation and extract amplitude inf growth information from it. In this model, we are mostly interested in um, the A sub K parameter. We can, um, we can, and the, this, um, and yeah, what is it? The growth rate, the growth rate is hidden in this parameter, which was given a few slides ago. So that's the analysis. When you have, after you have the, after you have the data for when you, um, when you disperse the particles at the interface, you compare that data to previously when you didn't have anything on the interface. So your, so the, the question is what happens when, essentially what happens when you introduce mass to the interface. Although I have to say that so far we have made significant progress in that we proved that this whole like unnatural configuration is 
experiment, at least experimentally feasible. Because imagine this, you have essentially water floating on top of oil and then you dis you disperse a layer of sand, silicon dioxide particles at the interface. So this is uh, as, absurd, as, as absurd as that sounds, this is actually doable. And the next step would, the, the, the next step would be for us to form a uniform layer of silicon dioxide particles. So that's something we've been struggling to do so far because for unknown reasons. And I believe probably we can do some, like some, some things we can do are probably like um, we could change the ratio at which we premix the colloid with manganese chloride solution. And then during the, you know, the deposition stage, we, you try your best to, 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 disperse, to disperse the particles evenly, or maybe you might even have to resort to another sort of particles that are functionalized and they're designed to prevent themselves from clumping up together. So that's basically what, um, what this project is about. So um, at last, I'd like to thank Dr. Rosenblatt for his consistent guidance and his generous help on everything. I've been really learning a lot of things from him and this project is supported in part by the NSF. And thank you for everyone for listening. I'd be happy to take questions if you have any. Some questions from anyone. Um, yes. Walter, go ahead. Yes, so so you measure this AK of T, you say, right? Well, that's the goal at least. And in the beginning you mentioned that it goes like hyperbolic cosine. Right. The hyperbolic cosine, uh, yeah. Hyperbolic cosine. Um, I should have, I yeah, I should have mentioned this, but essentially, I'm sorry, you what? Actually see that? How would you see the difference between that and just an exponential? Yeah, um, essentially, um, even at the beginning, yeah, I should have mentioned this, but even at the beginning, I believe the, because in the hyperbolic cosine, you have, you still have a, like a, um, on the exponent, you have a negative number. And then at, even at the beginning, that, num that negative number can't, doesn't play as much role as the positive part. So I guess essentially in, in another, in another um, formula, it's, it's actually the negative part is completely omitted. I just, I don't know why I put that. Exponentially. Yeah, it's, it, it grows exponentially, essentially. So did you actually see that in any of your analysis? So um, basically plot it on a log scale or something or previous yeah pr in, on the previous data based on previous data you like i didn't attach it here but previous data if you plot it if you, if you have a log log plot it would it would have a near linear um yeah line right there and it semi, is yeah. semi log semi log semi log semi log paper log linear paper. Okay. Yeah. So, so it's something to do with boundary conditions in this now with the Stokes equation, I imagine. I, I imagine that something, why they write it as cos, hyperbolic cosine must have been something to do with boundary conditions in this now. That's yeah, that, that, that's, 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 that's a formal solution. Nobody, nobody has ever seen the decaying exponential part. I see, okay, thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Not then, I'll thank Ricky again. And remember, uh, the original schedule had us ending now, but one of the talks moved from this morning to now, and I see Adam's here. So Adam, uh, howdy. Hmm? Uh, can everyone hear me all right? I just want to make sure that- yeah, You're on your phone instead of, or are you on the- uh... Yep, I'm on my phone, and my computer should have the um, okay, well, thingamajig. Awesome, cool. So sharing. I will start sharing. Beautiful. Okay, looks right. good. Go ahead. Cool. So this is my, uh, you know, senior symposium or senior uh, capstone symposium presentation for my senior project, which is named the enhancement of spontaneous emission from epsilon near zero cavities. Um, I'm working with the Department of Physics here at Case Western Uni Reserve University, uh, with my PI being uh, Professor Giuseppe Strangi. So. 
I guess to start the to start this a uh, little bit of an overview of the project are uh, what we what we were aiming what we are aiming to do is create a meta material that has an effective permittivity that approaches zero at a designated bandwidth, which is called an ENZ meta material. Uh, but we also seek to couple this with another class of hyper of meta material, which is a hyperbolic meta material. Um, and so we seek to combine those and prove that they have an enhancement of the spontaneous emission rate within a novel geometry within a novel cavity geometry. Uh, so quickly, let's go over what everything uh, what that all kind of means. Uh, first off, a meta material, which is basically a artificial material in which a unit cell, which it could be, you know, layers or it could be um, nano wires or something along those lines. Uh, the unit cell for that for that structure is much, much smaller than the wavelength of light, uh, incident light. And so the incident light under uh, would see this as an effective medium, uh, creating all sorts of arbitrary optical uh, properties that are extremely tunable to whatever you kind of need um, and has drawn a lot of attention over the years uh, with, you know, the op with the ability to do this in the optical regime, you know, kind of really kicking off now. So some key concepts, as I was talking about, the, the whole thing that metamaterials hinge on is the effective medium theory, which is, you know, showing that, you know, there is an effective medium when you have small enough unit cell size. Um, ooh, too far, sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, the hyperbolic dispersion. So, if you've taken any sort of ENM uh, that talks about, you know, light, you'll uh, you'll hear about the dispersion relation when you have a uh, dispersive medium, which is basically the allowed um, wave vectors, you know, k for a given frequency, omega. And so, normally you have an elliptic dispersion, which is, you know, in frequency space, you know, like you do a Fourier, tr Fourier transform, it would be a ellipsoid in 3D space, so for all the directions. When you have a hyperbolic dispersion, obviously it then becomes a hyperboloid, which is unbounded technically. Um, and so that allows the that allows the presence of high K modes or high momentum modes, which is something that is not present in, it's not present, well, it's present in other materials, but it um, they don't propagate or trend or don't propagate or um, carry any sort of energy. So it's kind of like they're not really existing, basically. Um, and then the other thing that, so the other kind of concept that this project hinges on is the spontaneous emission, which is one of those three, the three main radiative processes. Um, the other two being stimulated emission and absorption. Stimulated emission being the stuff that lasers work off of. Spontaneous emission is more like the, you know, what you do in um, like intro, intro, uh, QM, where you have, you know, like, or the Bohr model of the atom, where, you know, you put light in, you raise the atom or the molecule to an excited state, and then the emitter decays and releases a photon. Um, and so the reason why this, we are studying the spontaneous emission is because it's a, it's governed by the photonic density of states, much like the electronic density of states, but for photons. And you can't really directly measure the photonic density of states. However, the spontaneous emission is basically pretty much dependent on this, uh, on that. And so if you modify the photonic density of states, you're gonna modify the spontaneous emission and you can actually measure the spontaneous emission very well. It's a well-documented well -documented phenomenon. Okay, so why are we using ENZ and hyperbolic metamaterials uh, for this purpose? Why are they interesting? So ENZs, are a uh, are, an, are part of the class of metamaterials where, uh, like I said, the permittivity goes to zero, but also the phase of the reflected light also goes to zero within a given bandwidth. And so when that happens, you have um, enhanced electric field enhanced electric fields because it acts as a dielectric insulator um, or an electric insulator versus you know kind of like a superconductor uh, with magnetic fields. Um, and so anywhere near in ENZ surface, you'll have an enhanced or very strong electric field. The other, the other, one of the other big effects that people, uh, that scientists have been really studying is phase front manipulation. Um, because the phase velocity of the, any, uh, the phase velocity in this medium, because it's epsilon goes to zero, the phase, velo the phase velocity is um, inversely proportional to the dielectric coefficient, epsilon. And so if epsilon goes to zero, the phase 
the phase velocity goes to infinity and you basically have something where light at you know light can come in with different phases uh, like a fi uh, different phase fronts but coming uh, after passing through the material will have a unified phase front um, and so this is useful for wave guys and nonlinear optics and is being potentially used for nanoscale optical cir circuits called metatronics um, which is going to be the next kind of step towards our you know that's going to be the next step in our electronics potentially so this has got you know potentially far reaching applications um, so hyperbolic metamaterials are uh, their key fit their whole thing is the high momentum mode the high k modes which like i was uh, previously stating cannot propagate within normal ellipse uh, ellipsoid yeah, elliptic dispersion materials um, they don't trans yeah they don't carry any energy or they just decay away immediately uh, however these can propagate within an a hyperbolic dispersion medium and so the a lot of the focus on you know modifying the photonic density of states and measuring it with spontaneous emission has been using hyperbolic metamaterials because it's a very broadband effect as soon as you um basically you need an anisotropic material and so if the um which you know you get into like 3d 3d math uh, 3d math and tensors and all that but basically whatever direction the light's going in the permittivity in that direction if it's you know if it and the permittive permittivity in the other two directions are of opposite signs then you have hyperbolic dispersion uh you know like a hyperboloid and um you know as long as those as long as that criteria is met then you have you know for the rest you know any other wavelength it will be a hyperbolic dispersion material which is you know usually the way they do or uh, the way they were doing photonic density of state manipulation before was something with like you know would only work on a certain bandwidth it was uh, or limited in that way shape or form and so this is very useful for that and because these high k modes also carry energy and information um they can be potentially used for non-diffraction limited imaging however that's a little bit that's not really part of the scope of my project but it is a useful thing to know um for these metamaterials so the motivation so you know because of the enhancement of the electric field and these high and the you know the opening up of the high k modes, both classes, both metamaterials in ENZ and a hyperbolic metamaterial can alter the photonic density of states, and you can measure that with um, via the spontaneous emission. And it's something that has been recently uh, gained a lot of interest. Uh, it's gained a lot of interest. So we are seeking to kind of go further and do uh, you know show that it can do more than just uh that, that it can do that we can do more um like i was kind of saying our, uh earlier most people have focused solely on either hyperbolic metamaterials or epsilon near zero uh effects for this kind of thing um and so we're showing that these effects you know as soon as you have one you can have the other as soon as the you know your dielectric coefficient goes to zero if you have an anisotropic material you know if you just let it go negative if you just let the permittivity in that direction go negative, then you have a hyperbolic metamaterial afterwards. Um, so you get double the effects. It's an even more broadband effect, uh, even more broadband kind of thing. Um, and so we're working with combining both of these. Uh, and we've already shown, uh, actually, this was Theodore Lasso, Ted's uh, Ted senior project, if you guys remember him, but he showed that in a planar configuration, which you'll see on the bottom left, uh, if you put some die, you know, some some diameters uh, on top of an ENZ slash, you know, hyperbolic metamaterial surface um, and measure the spontaneous emission rate. When you get into the epsilon near zero and pass that to the hyperbolic regime, you will see a decrease in the, or you will see an increase in the spontaneous emission rate and enhancement. And so we are now, uh, I want to take that a step further uh, with these already kind of novel um, metamaterials and put the emitters into a, ca a nanoscale cavity with the goal of that proving um, Basically, this is something that really ever has hasn't really been done before. Um, it's very it's kind of difficult. To, I mean, we've managed to the point where we can do these kinds of things, but it's not it's still rather difficult and there's a lot of kind of obstacles in the way. So we're trying to show this is like something that's truly possible because it's yeah, we're just trying to show it's something that's truly possible because, you know, uh, that's what science is. So the so how did we go out? How do we go about achieving that? So for starters, um, Actually, let me go back real quick. So as you can kind of see um, on the bottom left picture here, you'll see that it's alternating layers of, you know, 
silver and AL203, which is alumina. Um, and, you know, it's five bilayers of five uniform bilayers of that uh, to create our ENC hyperbolic metamaterial, um, hyperbolic metamaterial. And in order to like find the correct thicknesses for, you know, the silver and the alumina, uh, we turn to simulations. Um, and so the two main ones that we used are something called transfer matrix, transfer matrix method or TMM and um, FD, finite difference time domain, FDTD uh, algorithms to kind of simulate the optical properties uh, as, as we change the thicknesses and find what, uh, you know, so we can find what we want. So, um, let me take a breath, sorry. <laughs> but um, so the transfer matrix method algorithm uh, we made in-house uh, in the, you know, in the lab of Professor, you know, Professor Strangi. Um, and basically what it is, is it allows you to basically allows you to simulate what light would, you know, how light would interact with a medium, uh, you know, a multi-layered medium, uh, which is what we are using. And so you can change the thicknesses and it'll show you measurable optical properties, such as like the reflection, the transmission. And if you uh, are, you know, measuring things with optics, usually you might use something like ellipsometry which is um, a, a, another, common another common standard uh, measurement tool in this field. And so it can also generate those kinds of results as well. And um, so uh, it can also calculate things. Yeah, from there, you can also then calculate the uh, phase of reflected light and the, um, the permittivity from that. So we were able to, uh, I was able to create an optimization program to just, you know, a minimization kind of uh, algorithm to find the uh, correct thicknesses for the the you know the silver and the alumina in in, in the bilayers. Uh, the FDTD uh, uh, simulator algorithm is just we used Comsol. Um, basically, we you know we wanted to create an ENZ uh, or we wanted to create a metamaterial that had the ENZ effects at around 550 nanometers, um, and then the hyperbolic effects would be past that you know higher wavelengths. Um, we wanted to line those effects up with um, the cavity, the cavity medium itself, um, because the ENZ should have an enhanced electric field at, you know, in the, in that regime, uh, we wanted to make sure that there was a, you know, a resonance that would form. Um, and so the, and so Comsol is able to show things like that. And it's able to give you things like the field profile, you know, as a function of thickness or position throughout the structure. Um, and so this is the schematics that we were able to come up with. Uh, so if you look on your left, these, these two, uh, yeah, the two graphs on your left are for the individual ENZ hyperbolic material bilayers. So as you'll see um, on the top graph, this is the components of the permittivity in the parallel and perpendicular um, directions. And so as you can see, the blue line, which is the uh, parallel component of the permittivity, it crosses zero right around 560 nanometers. Ignore the black dotted line that's vertical. Um, I missed that and it was just an accident, but um, it crosses right around 560 nanometers. And well, and once it crosses that, you'll notice that the green line, the you know perpendicular component is still positive throughout that. So um, you know, we have our hyperbolic dispersion past about 560 nanometers. Um, the bottom graph is the phase of reflected light, which is the other criteria for having an ENZ material, metamaterial. And so as you can see, um, the criteria, it's a little wishy-washy. However, it's kind of standard for, you know, for an ENZ, it needs the, um, you'd like the, you know, permittivity to be, you know, less than 0.5, pretty much as close to zero as you can get it. Um, and the phase of reflected light to be within about 10, 10 degrees. Um, and so as you can see, right around 550 nanometers, well, I, for the bottom graph, it's about 535, I think, but at 550 nanometers, 540 nanometers, the, um, you know, these two effects line up. And so in that, you know, kind of 10 nanometer range, uh, you know, 10, 10, 20 nanometer range, uh, you know, range right there, we have an ENZ metamaterial. And then past that, we have a, uh, hyperbolic metamaterial. So that was using transfer matrix method um, by and you know varying the thicknesses to get what we want. Um, and what we found was that the you know 
the with the five bilayers, the you should have about 36 or you should have 36 nanometers of alumina and eight nanometers of silver um, for every single bilayer, and you should be able to have this kind of effect. Um, then we move to Comsol, and I'm sorry the graphs are really blurry, but Comsol really didn't want me like taking these pictures off of you know like taking these graphs off of it. Um, but you know this this graph on the right shows the uh, strength of the electric field. Uh, as a function of on the x-axis, the position within the superstructure and the wavelength of light that, or yeah, the wavelength of light that you're using as like an incident incident wavelength. And so as you can see with a 30 nanometer cavity, um, if the cavity is that thick, you'll see, you know, right around 560, a little bit below that, there's a resonance there where the cavity, where the electric field's at its strongest point there. And so that's what we were aiming to do is to line those, you know, line the electric or the ENZ effects from both of the, you know, both of the cap, both of the cavity walls, line them up and create a little bit of a resonance. Um, and that way we would, we would assume also the fact that, you know, the cavity is only 30 nanometers large, um, that the emitters will be able to couple to both, of, you know, both materials that way. So that was how we, that was the designs that we came up using simulation. And so how do we make that? So we fabricate this uh, using the, you know, using chemical vapor deposition systems within the Moore Center at um, in the White Building. So uh, the way you do that is basically you can you can basically just um, boil silver. Uh, you heat it up, and it goes from a solid to a gas. And gases, as you know, disperse uh, within a you know within a you know within its chamber that it's in. And so if you have like a you know, if you put this in a vacuum, you boil some silver, uh, the gas will then float up in a kind of even way and, you know, coat our substrates, which are just glass slides. Uh, for the alumina, it is, uh, for the alumina, we, uh, it's done using electron beam deposition, which is, you just, it sounds exactly as it is. You shoot electrons at, you know, a chunk of alumina and start, like, basically you make a gas like that. Uh, and that's because it's a dielectric, so it's a little bit, you can't just boil it, apparently. Um, oh, one other thing, real quick. Um, the, yes, if, uh, <laughs> so if you look in the bottom left picture, you'll see that there's GE, a half a nanometer of germanium. So, um, you know, this is, yeah, using these systems is very wishy-washy and uh, it's the most challenging and time-consuming step. And so getting it perfectly, you know, the layers need to be, it needs to be exactly as the simulations for it to, you know, really match the simulations. And so we need like the most uniform, smooth, correct thickness step, uh, you know, layers every single time. Uh, and so we found that by using a wetting layer of germanium, you know, very, very small, uh, less than a nanometer's worth, it creates a much smoother silver film. I felt like I needed to mention that, sorry. Um, but yeah, so basically what we would do is we'd depo uh, we'd deposit the first cat or first, ENZ, you know, all five bilayers. Uh, we would measure it using an ellipsometer, which gives us the reflection, the transmission. Um, we would do some in situ uh, kind of measurements with a stylus profilometer, which is like a analog AFM, uh, atomic force microscopy. Basically, you use a real small pinhead and just touch down and see how thick this uh, this sample is. And so we're able to get thicknesses for the individual bilayers um, and make sure that we're staying on track with our deposition. Um, once we have the first cavity wall uh, validated as an ENZ. Um, then we would go and spin coat a poly, a dye-doped PMMA or polymethyl methacrylate. Um, you know, the dye, the cavity medium, we would use a spin coater. Um, you just design, dissolve, eh, dissolve some dye and plastic into a, into, yeah, dissolve some dye and plastic and, um, and you know, spin it really fast and it dries and makes a small layer. Uh, and then after that, you can then put the next cavity layer on top, and that's how you create the cavity. Like I said, a little bit easier said than done. Um, I've been struggling to do this all, you know, all year. Um, to measure the spontaneous emission rate, uh, what you do is you take a laser. So yeah, that's how you make it. Then to measure the actual spontaneous emission rate, you take a pulsing laser um, and to excite the dye, and then you have a detector um, of some sort that can measure the output photons. Um, yeah, measure the output photons uh, as a function of emission wavelength. The dye that we use is broadband. It's not like a you know a true like bore atom where you only put light in and only one wavelength of light will come out. Um, it's a broad spectrum kind of dye. 
Um, and so depending on the emission wavelength of the dye, the spontaneous emission rate should be different as we go from, you know, elliptic or yeah, elliptic dispersion, our ENZ regime, and then the hyperbolic regime. Um, like I was saying, the deposition step is the hardest thing. Um, I have not finished creating the cavity samples due to just time restrictions um, and mechanical error, uh, mechanical errors. Um, and so I'm still working on that. However, this is, this is the, these are the results from um, actually Ted's presentation, just to get you, just to show you what I'm expecting. So the, you know, uh, as we're making the sample, if you look on the graph to your left, um, that doesn't look like the other ones. Um, as we're making the sample, you know, we completed the cavity, we would then, you know, uh, we then compare the reflection transmission measurements uh, with the simulations and showing that, you know, proving that those line up, then we should be, you know, then we can assume that all the other assumptions we've made are correct. And then uh, when we measure the spontaneous emission rate, the top two graphs are uh, what you would see. It decay, you know, the light decays away. And then, um, you know, as a function, then the bottom two graphs can show the lifetime, which is just the inverse of the spontaneous emission rate. Um, you know, the lifetime is a function of the emission wavelength. And so the black points are the, uh, would be for our ENZ and the blue would be for a silver control sample of some sort. And, you know, once you get into the near zero and hyperbolic, the, you know, the lifetime of the dye in the, in the, of our ENZ cavity should be much faster than that of, you know, a control sample of some sort. Um, but yeah, so that's that. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge um, my PI, obviously, Professor Giuseppe Strangi uh, and his lab and the people in it in the nanoplasm lab um, and the Moore Center and Dr. Ina Martin and uh, Giuseppe Leo of Unicau, who taught me how to do the Tomsil stuff uh, and helped me with that. So that's everything I have. Um, thank you so much for listening. And um, yeah, does anyone have any questions? Yeah, I see Professor Lambert and Brown are unmuted. So go ahead if you have questions. Go ahead. Yeah, okay, so this is Walter. So um, let me ask you a question. So basically you can design either your material to have the um, the zero point crossing of your epsilon to be at a certain wavelength, or you can adjust your your quantum well, right? I mean, or your, your cavity size, and because you want the two to be in resonance. So I was wondering, as you mentioned, when you actually try to make it, it's not easy. So I was wondering if you can, with your software, also model, you know, if your thicknesses were not exactly the same of your cavity everywhere, what detrimental effects that would have on what you would expect to see. And if you could sort of figure out how precise your, your deposition needs to be to see the effects that you're hoping to see. Um, yeah, so to answer the first part of your question, um, the simulations that we were doing, uh, let me go back to what I was talking about. Yeah, so on the bottom right would be kind of what you're talking about. Um, you know, doing that, this is a 2D simulation, you know, you only have a, you know, up and down and across, you know, for the thickness, uh, creating a third dimension and adding all sorts of like um, non-idealities like that um, would be very, very challenging and time consuming. Um, so I did not specifically do that. However, um, if you, you can use transfer matrix method for that because it's a lot quicker and um, simpler and you can add sort of non-idealities like, oh, let's say in bilayer three, alumina, de you know, I deposited five more nanometers of alumina, what happens? Um, generally with things like that, we've kind of, you know, we've done that kind of, you know, testing out and it needs to be pretty much exact, like, you know, within like a nanometer pretty much every single time for like all of our layers. Um, and so that's the other reason why this is taking so long is because, you know, if I mess up somewhere in the beginning, the whole run's kind of just ruined at that point. Um, but I was wondering and, also if you do the measurements and you see deviations from your ideal behavior, can you use that sort of backwards to see, you know, analyze, you know, how inhomogeneous your thickness of your, your cavity is, for example? Or, yeah, then oh, yeah. oh, yeah. Um, Yes, actually. So our ellipsometer, um, which was made by J.A. Woolham, uh, it has, you know, it not only measures, it's got a, like a computer program and like, you know, software set up around that where you can actually kind of, you can fit the um, reflection, reflection and ellipsometry coefficient measurements 
um, you know, you input a model and say, oh, it's got these thicknesses and you can vary the, you know, fit the thicknesses or some sort of non-ideality like rough surface roughness and things like that. So yes, we can do that. Um, but usually if it's not, if it doesn't show the properties we wanted at that point, I'm kind of pitching it and trying to start again because if it's not going to work, it's just not going to work, you know? Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Just one, Adam. Uh, how yep. critical is it that you have five bilayers? Seems like you have an easier time getting good samples with just three or something. You did look. Um, so the upon like so I was talking with Professor Strange about this as well. Actually, um, most like in the I, when I was doing my literature review, um, it kind of depended. Some people do like ten bilayers, and the like the layers are even smaller. You know, like four and 18 nanometers of you know silver and aluminum respectively and then they just do that double it um so actually we're kind of on the low end of of you know unit set repeating unit cells um so we could i probably could have gotten away with four um i potentially i didn't look into it enough um just because i was you know everything i'd already set up at least in terms of simulation was already with five and um I was like, if I, you know, I found, I found the, the kind of like schematic that would work with that. Um, and so I have to go back and like do four nanometer, you know, four bilayers, it might not even work. Um, it was a little bit, just, just seemed a little prohibitive. Uh, and, but yeah, it, it would be nice if I could, but, and it, I'm already on the low end of uh, bilayers as is. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Are there any other questions? I don't see any hands up. So if not, I'll thank you. Thank you, guys. Uh, the senior project, physics senior project seminar symposium is over. I'll hang on for a little while in case anyone has any questions for me or wants to talk to each other, but feel free to leave. Take care, y'all. Congrats on everything. Andrew.